When the warp storm hit the Mueller system, it made its arrival known in the typical fashion of all things that hail from the Empyrean, in screams and death. Millions died in the first hours, and many more in the following weeks. The astropaths aboard the ship Lover of the Moon died in agony when demons ripped them apart from within. The ship, that had carried food from the Agri world to the hives of Mueller Prime and Secundus, was lost to the creatures of the warp, the agony of its crew fueling the tempest. In the hive cities, ten million people would suffer the throes of famine as the supplies they needed never arrived. The few ships that the system still had for its defense were lost when hundreds of crew members went crazy and detonated the warp engines of their ships, weakening the veil between reality and the Empyrean even further. On the Forge World C2746-SS 885, or Mueller Tertius as the Administratum called it, a single line of randomized code suddenly gained self-awareness, and began to spread to all systems of the planet causing entire forges to stop working and two of them to explode. Dozens of servitors had their program overwritten by the anomaly, and began to attack the tech priests who were already faltering from the scrap code assaults on their own systems. In the hives of the twin hive worlds, nightmares plagued the people, driving them to insanity and causing riots that set entire districts in flames. The earth shook under the hold of the Empyrean's powers, sending towering buildings to the ground. The Arbits sent to restore order were met by thousands of crazed rioters, screaming unholy words and brandishing primitive weapons. The governors decreed martial law, and sent the PDF troopers to quell the rebellion. Soon, reports came back of entire platoons of Arbits and PDF joining the madness, starting to kill everything they came across. The Mueller system had been spared the worst of the war between Horus and the Emperor. They had sent soldiers to help the Imperial war effort but the people hadn't seen any battle themselves. That peace was over. Lord Governor Valens Tarsis, ruler of Mueller Prime, once general of the 147th Liberties Regiment, was a man who had fought many wars during his time in the Guard. He had fought for the Imperium in the Great Crusade as part of the 742nd Expeditionary Fleet, alongside a company of the Iron Hands. He had helped the Astartes to free the people of the Mueller system from their tyrannic overlords establishing instead the reign of the imperial truth. The wounds he had suffered in the final assault on the overlord's stronghold, however, had meant the end of his military career. He had lost his right leg and arm in the explosion of his command chimera, and the right side of his skull had been so horribly damaged that only the personal intervention of the Iron Hands apothecary, or Iron Priest, as he had called himself, had saved the old soldier's life. But the heavy augmentics he now wore in replacement were mainly focused on keeping him alive not making him able to fight again. Other generals would have kept their command, but Valence believed that a commander ought to be able to fight at his men's side if he wanted to be worthy of their obedience, and he had resigned from his prestigious position. In return, he had been granted governorship of the world he had freed, and had ruled it since then for almost a century. The augmentics and juvenile treatments meant that he was still as physically fit that he had ever been since he had been crippled, and his mind was as sharp and unforgiving as it had ever been. Valen's iron teeth Tarsus wasn't exactly loved by his people, but they did respect him. What in the name of bloody terror is that supposed to mean? The governor's iron fist crushed on the table, sending cracks on the priceless marble. The communication officer who had just delivered him his report looked at him, visibly intimidated. The, the PDF are formal, my lord. Some of the troops we sent to quell the riots have joined the rebels. They, they said that the men in question looked possessed. Dot. I heard you the first time, grunted Valens. Seeing the man cringe, he sighed. That was a rhetorical question, don't worry about it. Stay focused on what's actually important. Do we have any news of the squad sent to retake control of the Astra Telepathica's tower? Only a few words in the last hour, answered another operative. We cannot establish a stable Vox liaison with them, but it doesn't seem to be going well. Should I send them reinforcements? The governor pondered the question for a few seconds. He had taken command of all military forces on the planet when the warp storm had hit them, but he didn't have much to work with. The Arbits and the PDF, alongside his own honor guard from his old regiment, all in all, he had perhaps 20,000 soldiers. On a planet that supported 10 billion people, there was but a drop in an ocean of potential rioters but the world's compliance had gone without an hitch once the tyrannic dynasties had been toppled, the people are claiming their liberators. 
They had seen no reason to leave behind a strong complement of troops, and the regiments that had been raised from the world had long been sent to help the Imperium. So, as much as he hated the idea of letting his men die, Valens couldn't afford to spread his troops even more thinly. On the other hand, if the few reports they had about the tower were correct, preventing the situation there from worsening could very well be the most important battle on the entire world. Valens didn't believe in demons, but he had heard reports of the horrors unleashed by the architrator Horus and his servants during what was coming to be called the heresy. The governor took his decision. Turning his glance to another operator, he said in a stern voice, Send this message to the artillery, the tower of the Astra Telepathica is to be considered lost to the enemy and impossible to salvage. Raise it to the ground. But, my lord, we have soldiers inside the tower. And I fear that they will be grateful we give them a quick death. Do it. The operator turned back to transmit the governor's order. Valens knew full well what he had just ordered. Without astropaths, even when the warp storm ended, they would still be cut off from the rest of the Imperium. He would have to hope that some of the private psychers used by the richest nobles on Mueller Prime would survive the chaos. Wait. What was that, in the sky? Wasn't that a trail of flame coming down, amidst the madness of the storm? Throne of Terror, breathed Valens. These are drop pods. My lord? asked one of the surrounding officers. What's wrong? Give me that orspex. He shouted, ripping it off the man's hands. He pointed the engine toward the trail of fire, and magnified the image. Yes, these were Astartes drop pods. A flare of hope rose in his chest. With the help of space marines, he could still save this situation. He could. Valens Tarsis recognized the emblem on the falling crafts, and a cold hand tightened around his heart. This was the heraldy of the 16th Legion, the greatest traitors of all. The sons of Horus had come, to avenge the death of their father at the Emperor's hands. If the old man had known how long he was, he would have been even more worried. I feel the butcher's nails scratching at my brain, sending surges of pain through my mind. This is Angron's gift and curse, and to bear it is to be a slave to the urge to kill. The crude implants can never be removed, and they gnaw at our brain, stimulating our bloodlust while suppressing all other pleasures and joys. I see Alexandre before me, collapsed in the wall of the drop pod. He is leader of my pack, for he is strong in battle. But he is a fool. I heard him challenge Arkan's authority, and this enrages me. The Awakened One knows better than us how to wage war. Once, we could have planned it ourselves, but that was before the Eightfold Path, before the Nails, before Angron. The Nails punish me for daring to doubt the one who gave me to them, but I cling to my thoughts stubbornly. It is difficult, more and more so as time passes. Constant pain has eroded my mind, and I know it. It is not a pleasing knowledge. Only in battle can we find peace, only in blood can we find release. I remember Alexandra as he was once, a great commander, lord of a thousand of us. Look at him now, little more than an enraged beast, that must be contained by its master's will until it is time to unleash it. His warriors have splintered, forming the packs aboard the Hand of Ruin. This is what we have become, this is the Twelfth Legion's new face. The world below us is aflame with chaos and destruction, even before we first step foot on it. These animals have turned against each other in an heartbeat of the Empyrean. To think that we once thought for such cattle. My brothers think that we are being honored by being sent first, but they are naive. I know why Arkan sent us first. He wants to know if we can still be useful in spite of the rage that rules us now, if we can still be controlled. My squad mates and the other world eaters deployed in this strike at the enemy's command force are a trial of our capability. I do not want to be found wanting, but the nails care nothing for Arkan's designs. All they want is blood. Arkan knows that. Sometimes I wonder if there is anything he does not know. A drop pod's fall isn't precise. We will crash away from our target, in the middle of a district filled with civilians. This is Arkan's intent. Can we ignore the urge to kill long enough to find our prey? I do not know, but this will be interesting, at least. Valens watched in mute horror as the drop pods fell across his city. He had heard the reports about the massacre of Istvan, about the heresy and how it had ended. But the traitor legions were supposed to have been pushed back into the Eye of Terror, trapped in that hellish realm. How could they be here? My lord, said one of his guards. We need to get you to safety. Valens turned to the man. 
I will not abandon my people, soldier. They need me here to coordinate the battle. These are Astartes, my lord. They are going to tear through our defenses like paper. If you die, the planet will be lost. The man's words burnt with the acid of unwelcome truth. Only his authority had prevented the terrified imperial forces to break apart. As much as the notion repugned him, he needed to escape or there would be no hope of mounting any resistance against the traitors. Then where you suggest we go? We need to leave the palace. If we can hide in the districts that have not yet fallen to the chaos, we can set up another base of operations. You. Hurry up and take the portable Vox. We are leaving. Less than a minute later, Valence was led by his guards through one of the palace's evacuation tunnels. The imposing building had been constructed under the command of one of the dynasties of the pre-compliance era, and was ripe with such hidden ways. The one they were following would lead them to the cave of a bar in the neighborhood, opposite to the point where the drop pods had landed. The drop pod hits the ground, and the shock is enough to nearly knock me out. But the nails won't let me fall unconscious, not when there is so much prey at hand. I can smell their fear, it is a scent that pleases my mechanical tyrants. The doors open, and we are released. Arkan has sent us all to this place, he must hope that at last one of us will remember the orders he gave. That is smart of him. I raise my chain axe as I charge out, following Alexandra's lead. The weapon is in a perfect state, I have found out that maintaining my gear is one of the few activities that diminish the pain of the butcher's nails. Not a lot, but enough to make it bearable between the kills. But now, it is time to spill blood. There are mortals around us, running away from the impact. Ignorant fools, no one runs from the world eaters. I am on them, my chain axe bites into flesh, I tear them apart, I hear their screams of fear and pain, the taste of blood on my tongue is intoxicating, no. I must stay in control. I force down the rage, the fury. The pain redoubles, made even worse by the fact that I was almost free of it for a moment. The Eightfold Path demands me to kill, to abandon myself to the Red Veil's embrace, but I deny it. It is a futile struggle, and I know it. Many among the Legion try to resist the changes wrought upon us by the Nails, but even an Astartes cannot live in endless torment without something breaking. In the end, those who do not die soon enough will become mindless beasts, capable only of killing and killing and killing and stay in control. Focus on the mission. I look around myself, still wet in the blood of my victims, and find the scene I was expecting. Most of my brethren have lost control of themselves, and are indulging their bloodlust upon the helpless populace of this city. The wind brings me the scent of ashes and blood, and I can taste the power of the warp in it. The storm has touched this world too. It has driven the people of the slums insane, forcing them to kill to alleviate the pain, just like us. I am surprised to see that Alexandra, too, is still in control of himself. He looks at me, and each of us recognizes that the other is still sane. There is no time to waste, our quarry must already be running. We make our way toward the palace, ready to kill. There is only two of us at first, but more of the Astartes deployed follow us as we advance, drawn to us like sharks are drawn to blood as we tear apart the defenseless mortals that dare to stand in our way. My brothers know, on some primitive level, then following us will give them the opportunity to kill more worthy foes. That, too is an image of my legion's future. I am glad I will not be here to see what happens to the bulk of the Twelfth's forces in the Eye of Terror. Perhaps, perhaps they are already all dead, after killing each other while screaming to the skies of a warp-consumed world? Perhaps we are all that remains of Angron's sons? The nails tear at me, and I launch myself forward. There is a barricade before us, blocking the entrance of the castle, manned by human soldiers with las guns. They see us charging them and they raise their weapons, shooting against us with no hope for their frail guns to hurt our power armor. These are no cowards. They do not run nor do they beg. I can taste their fear, its stench is overpowering, almost stronger than the smell of blood, and yet they do not break. A commendable effort, but ultimately futile. I am on them in a second, and they are dead in the next. Alexandra is just behind me, and I can feel his gaze upon my back. It makes my scar aches, the one I suffered when we ran from terror. It is a mark of shame among my brothers, to carry a scar on this part of your body. There are whispers in the wind, over the tune of the nails. That is the warp speaking to me. 
I know better than to listen, of course, but they do not try to tempt or distract me. They are telling me where is our prey. It is trying to escape us, running away? Why? One who leads soldiers such as these should be ready to die at their side, should he not? I break from the rest of my brothers, letting them run toward the castle's center. Alexandra notices my move, but he makes no attempt to stop me. He must think I am giving in to the nails, and searching for closer prey than our quarry, perhaps he is right. Perhaps the whispers are merely a trick of the nails to make me break sooner. I do not know if that is the case. I do not even know if I care any more. I walk through the corridors, no one standing in my path. The walls are covered in dried blood, the palace has been breached before. How long have the riots outside been going on? Weeks? Months? I do not remember how long the journey lasted from Ailey, and even if I did, it would not tell me how long this planet has been under the storm. The whispers lead me forward, and the pain of the nails recedes as I follow. I am not sure I could stop following them now, even if I wanted. The relief from the pain is just, overwhelming. I sense something on my right, and I hurl my chain axe at it without a thought. There is only a wall on its path, but it collapses under my weapon, revealing a hidden way through the palace's walls. The whispers turn into shouts, and I know that the quarry is there. I howl in answer to the voices of the warp, and start running down the tunnel. The voices have led me here so that I may accomplish Arkan's will, it seems my lord has the favor of the Octid. That is what the whispers were, the voice of the warp, driving me to my prey. The warpborn have taken hold of this planet, and in their grip all shall offer them skulls, be them their foes or their own. It does not matter to the Eightfold Path. All that matters to them is that blood keeps on flowing. The sons of Angron are devoted to fulfill this urge and now we do no longer have anything to restrain us. This is our purpose. This is our way. This is freedom, to kill anyone daring to oppose us, to unleash our fury against our foes, tooth, tooth, no. This is no freedom. This. Is. Slavery. And I know, deep into my soul, that I will never be able to escape these chains. The group stopped in its tracks when they heard the dreadful sound coming from behind them, quickly followed by the sound of ceramite boots hitting the ground in broad steps. The soldiers took position, half of them preparing to make a stand while the others forced the governor to continue. But Valens took a glance of the enemy before he was forced to start to run as well as his augmentics allowed him. It was a single towering giant in power armor, wielding a chain axe and covered in blood. Despite the gore, Valens recognized the color pattern of the traitorous Astartes, white and blue, and his fears were made real as he confirmed what the fragmented reports he had received from the soldiers left upstairs had told him. This was a world eater, one of the Twelfth Legion's warriors. A son of Angron. Death made flesh, driven to insanity by forbidden techno-arcanes that had nearly brought Sensia to the Legion even before the heresy. Valen's guards were quite possibly the best soldiers he had under his command. Like him, they were veterans of the Imperial Guard, dispatched to serve as his retinue after their predecessors had retired. They had fought together on a dozen campaigns before being sent to him. There were ten of them, armed with the best weapons the Imperium could provide to normal men, willing to give their lives to defend their lord. The old man felt a surge of pride at the sight. In perfect synchronization, they raised their weapons and opened fire. The weapons of the paper skins are more powerful than those I have faced before, and I feel the pain of last burn on my chest. The pain is laughable, however, compared to what I have endured under the butcher's nails. These soldiers are wearing actual armor instead of the dresses that the others had to go with. They move like fighters, too, used to the arena of war. They will make good sport. I strike at one of them but he dodges and I miss. I miss? This is not normal. This is not supposed to happen. I am Astartes, and a son of Angron. A mere mortal shouldn't be able to avoid my blows. That is impossible, and yet it has happened, and the nails bit in my brain for that failure to draw blood. The soldiers keep firing at me, and at such a close range their shots are actually hurting me. The possibility that I may very well die here dawns on me and for a fraction of second I am tempted to simply let them kill me, to let go of this existence, to find true peace at last. The nails sense my weakening resolve, and it makes them scream. The pain is unbearable, I want it to stop, and there is only one way to make it so. The red veil falls on my eyes, my thoughts are stopped by the rage, I cannot think anymore, kill, kill, 
kill. Everything goes red, and I am lost to the tune of the butcher's nails. Governor Valens winced as he heard the screams of those he had left behind. He felt tears forming in his only biological eye, but forced them back. There would be time for mourning later, if they ever get out of this tunnel alive. He had little doubt that the planet was lost. If traitor Astartes came on top of everything else, they wouldn't be able to maintain order, and the entire world would fall to chaos and anarchy, easy prey for the renegades. But by the Emperor's name, he was going to make them fight for it. They would pay a price in Astartes' blood for the planet that had been placed in his care. They emerged amidst ruins, the building atop the tunnel having been destroyed in the earthquakes that had followed the opening of the storm. The air resonated with the screams of the dying and the mad, and the sound of bolt of fire from the palace. It appeared the kindred of the monster that had followed them in the tunnel had found the rest of the communication officers, those who had stayed behind to help monitor the retreat of the forces dispatched across the planet. Where do you suggest we go now, Lieutenant? We have to go to the rendezvous point, sir. All forces who received our last message must be disengaging and retreating to it. There, we will be able to determinate our next course of action. That actually made Valens chuckle. The soldier looked at him, afraid that the old man had finally lost his mind after all he had seen this day. But the Governor General shook his head, and said, There is only one course left to us, boy, we fight until we die, and hope to take with us as many of these bastards as we can. I wake up suddenly, the veil lifted from my mind. All of my body hurts, except my head. For the first time in decades, the nails are silent. I force myself to stand, feeling blood dripping from my many wounds. I can taste the coppery liquid in my mouth too, the rich flavor of Astarte's life. Did the human's weapons cause internal bleeding? I had not thought their last guns capable of doing such damage. Aren't last bolts supposed to cauterize the injuries they inflict? I look around, and I see the corpses of my victims. The soldiers have been hacked apart like cattle rendered limb from limb. It is difficult to see in such a mess, but I know that none of them tried to flee. They fought like true warriors, and I killed them like a beast. A rabid animal. The prey has escaped. I must find it. It cannot have gone far. I try to reach the rest of my brothers, to warn them that our quarry is away from the planned zone, but my vox only returns static. I do not know if that is because I am too deep underground, or because it has been damaged. It does not matter, though. I will continue even if I have to do it alone. You are not alone. What was that? Their journey through the streets wasn't an easy one. Several times, Valens and his guards had to open fire on the rioters who were hurling themselves at the armed men, screaming insanely before being promptly gunned down. Somehow, the governor suspected that the invaders were to blame for the madness that had overtaken his world. It seemed impossible, one couldn't control the warp. It was pure chaos and madness, and only the mutants of the Navigator Houses could peer into it without losing their very souls. But the betrayal of Horus had seemed impossible too. In a universe where the Emperor's brightest sun could turn to darkness, everything was possible, especially the worst. Survivors who had somehow clung to their sanity joined them. At first, the Lieutenant was opposed to letting these people slow them down, but a glare from Valens had convinced him otherwise. The governor may consider his planet doomed, and its people with it, but he would be damned before he abandoned them. What's happening, Lord Governor? asked one of the men that had joined with them. Why is everyone going crazy? Has the Emperor abandoned us? Valens shook his head. He didn't understand how so many people had started to refer to the Emperor as some divine entity since the Civil War. But it gave them hope, something to cling to in a galaxy that made less sense every day. So. He didn't say that the Emperor couldn't help them because he was trapped on the Golden Throne, maimed by his son. He didn't tell them that the Imperium couldn't help them because of the Warp Storm. Instead, he put his flesh hand on the man's shoulder, and said, I do not know, citizen. But whether or not he can still hear us, we will fight in his name. Heretics walk this world, doubtlessly responsible for the trouble we endure. I can promise you this, they will pay for their crime. The Imperium will punish them. He didn't say that, although he believed his own words, he doubted very much that the retribution would be enacted in time to save them. We will do our best, he thought. If that isn't enough, may the Emperor protect them. Suddenly, a blood-chilling scream filled the air, freezing the little convoy on place. A few seconds later, 
the soldiers snapped out of their trance and turned in the direction of the horrible sound. Valens thought that he recognized the howl, that it was that of the Astartes that had found them in the secret passage, but it couldn't be. That scream was too inhuman to be coming from a space marine, traitor or otherwise. He turned as well, and saw something out of his darkest nightmares. A lurching creature, wearing a parody of the Astartes' armor the color of freshly spilled blood, covered in thorns and spikes. It stood, immobile, a screaming chain axe held aloft it. Two chiropterian wings rose from its back, and two horns had torn through its helmet, while two orbs of red fire burnt through the helmet's visor. This wasn't a space marine, but it bore some twisted likeliness to the world eater Valen's bodyguards had sacrificed themselves to slow. In fact, the governor could see the image of a world being tuned on by a great jaw on the creature's shoulder. The color of the armor had changed, but this was the emblem of the Twelfth Legion. In an instant, the creature moved, and it was on them. Its chain axe ripped apart the soldiers that rose their weapons against it, while its free hand, clawed like the paw of an ancient death world alpha predator, cut through the civilian's flesh with ease. Valens felt his heart scream at the sight, and he knew in his soul that he wouldn't survive this day. So be it, then. If he was going to die, it would be fighting. The old man drew his own ceremonial chainsword with his metallic arm, and brought the weapon to life. Instantly, the infernal creature shifted its gaze at him. The old man held the glare of the creature, his weapon held steady. He would not show it his fear. He would die standing, in honor. The beast jumped at him, and he barely managed to deflect its first assault. The shock nearly sent his weapon away from his grip, but the iron priest's work held steady. He avoided another hit, then a third, while the rest of the people around him either ran or, in the case of the few soldiers remaining, tried to take aim at the creature without risking to harm him. Valens wanted to scream at them to take the damn shot, that to bring that monster down would be worth his life, but he couldn't. He could sense that a moment's distraction would be all it would take for the creature to end him. Then, he was forced to block the enemy's weapon directly. With a scream of agonized metal, his chainsword shattered under the impact, and the backlash sent him flying away, crashing on the street with his metallic arm ruined. He tried to stand, but felt the burning claw of the creature close on his neck, lifting him up until he stared directly in the burning pits of its eyes. He felt the breath of the beast, hot and reeking of blood. The moment seemed to stretch into eternity. Looking at the twin flames, Valens felt as if he was looking at the destruction of his world. Despair overwhelmed him. What hope was there for his people, when such monsters walked under the enemy's banner? This wasn't a foe human soldiers could hope to defeat. This was an avatar of war, death and bloodshed. It would kill him, and then nothing would stop the traitors from doing with Mueller Prime as they wanted. Valens Terrace knew that he had failed. He felt the cold certainty of that fact fall on him and drap him like a mantle. Strangely, it also felt liberating, to no longer be able to fight. To no longer have to force his old body to keep going. Here, at the threshold of death, he could finally let go. Surely the Emperor would forgive him? Strange. Now where had that thought come from? He wasn't a believer. He didn't trust in the words of the Lectitio Divinatus that all things were part of the Emperor's design. After all, how could he have known of his son's betrayal and not acted to prevent it? That made no sense. It took true faith, he guessed, to believe that life still had a purpose in a galaxy like the one they lived in. Well, now he had an answer for one question that had tormented him since he had heard of the Church of the Emperor's existence. But there was something else. Something he needed to know. Something that had been gnawing at him since he had first learned of the great war master's betrayal of all he had ever held dear. Why? He asked, his voice a barely audible whisper. Why are you doing this? What do you want? The demon paused. It tilted its horned head, as if trying to figure out the question's meaning. What does he mean? What do I want? Isn't that obvious? I want. I want. To kill. That voice again. It has not spoken since its first words in the tunnel. As I walked through the ruined city, hunting my quarry, I felt it hum, though, singing to the tune of the nails. Every moment during that walk has been a torture, my body burning with white-hot fire as it twisted itself into a new form. I am changing, that much I realize. But I do not understand. What is that voice? And what is it that I am becoming? I am the blood that runs through your veins. I am the death that you deliver to all those who stand in your path. I am your future, your destiny, 
as ordained by the Blood Father. I am one of the anointed, the chosen of corn. I am the hunt of the prey, the fury of battle. I am the death of all things and the never ending war. I am, Hekaran. The voice speaks again, and I see my reflection in the quarry's eyes. I look like a monster, a creature of the warp. The pressure of the butcher nails falter for a fraction of second, and in that instant, I understand what it is that I am now. I have seen it before, first on Istvan V, then during the Shadow War across Ultramar and the Siege of Terror, and finally, during the Exodus. I know it, and recognize it, and know I am damned. I am as the Galvorbach of the 17th Legion R. In superstitious cultures, I would be called a possessed man. But superstition has become reality, and a demon runs in my blood now. It is not that surprising, in truth. The whole planet is bathed in the power of the Empyrean, and the slaughter of millions must be driving the warp-born crazy. Even though I am no psyker, it must not have been hard for the creature that is the voice to find a way into my soul. And in that terrible moment of realization, I also understand what the answer to the quarry's question is. I open the jaw that has replaced my mouth, and I speak, the sound coming out a fusion of my own voice and the one in my head. We want the galaxy to burn. A few minutes later, the street was covered in blood and the remains of the dead. Only three beings yet lived. The possessed marine, the demon within him, and the old man who had once ruled Mueller Prime. The ex-governor laid down in the rubble, his augmentic leg ripped off his body. Pain tore at his nerves, and he couldn't even gather the strength to crawl. He looked up at the monster that stood nearby, unmoving, and spat, in a voice ripe with despair and impotent rage. What are you waiting for? Kill me already. You will not die yet, mortal. Not by our hand. What are you saying, beast? Our lord wants you alive. He has, plans for you. The traitor, twisted marine reached to its gorget with its clawed hand. It must have activated some kind of vox, for after a few seconds of static, Valence heard a new voice. Squad, report. This is Hector. I have him. Very well. Stay where you are. We have a lock on your shore he is still alive when the transport arrive. I understand. Do you now? Interesting. I am coming down myself. Our ETA is of ten minutes. Over. The monstrous Astartes cut the link, then simply stood there, immobile like a statue. Valens asked, What is this about, traitor? Are you hoping that I will aid you or your master in whatever mad goal it is you are pursuing? I would rather die than aid a traitor. There wasn't any answer. For a few more minutes, the old, crippled man spat out insults at the creature, hoping to push it to kill him. Somehow, he felt that this would be a better fate than whatever the voice at the other side of the Vox Link had in mind for him. But the traitor didn't move a muscle. Only its wings moved slightly under the winds caused by the burning of the city. Then, out of the ruins that surrounded the improbable pair, other traitor marines emerged. They wore the colors of the World Eaters, although some of them had painted their shoulder pauldrons black, hiding the heraldry of their legion. There were dozens of them, all covered in blood. Valens had seen Astartes fight many times during his time with the 742nd Expeditionary Fleet. But the World Eaters showed nothing of the discipline and cold control of the Iron Hands. They walked like predators, sharks circling their prey, unsure of whether or not they should attack. The Space Marines were supposed to know no fear, and the Berserkers of the Twelfth Legion even less than the rest of the Emperor's Angels of Death, but these warriors were clearly wary of the monster that had called itself Hector. One of the growling Astartes walked near Valen's immobile body, his chain axe twitching in his hand. Valens felt a surge of hope and fear mixed as he thought that the bloodthirsty warrior was going to kill him right now. But the monstrous Astartes turned and stared straight at the transhuman soldier, forcing him to retreat with the lone pressure of its gaze. Still, other traitor marines were closing in on the fallen governor, their eyes filled with bloodlust. Valens could feel their intent to kill, even from several meters away. The winged creature walked to his side and stood there, like a twisted, nightmarish parody of a guardian angel. But the other world eaters weren't deterred. I see them enclosing on us, and I can feel that they are gone. All of them have given in to the nails, only the impulse to kill matters to them now. The quarry is wounded, defenseless, even I am feeling the urge to crush him, to bathe in his old blood and take his skull. This one is a worthy foe. Old and wounded, yet cunning and tenacious. His skull would claim a place of honor on the blood god's throne. 
and you aren't making it easier. Arkan wants him alive. What do his wishes matter to us? Only the spilling of blood matters. Arkan is my lord, and he wants him alive. It is only by my power that you aren't feeling like your brain is on fire right now. Only I have the power to calm the pain, Hector. You would do well not to deny me. If we kill him, Arkan will kill us, or at least not use us ever again in such a critical mission. Would you deny us the right of taking hundred of skulls just so that the Blood Father can have this one faster? The future doesn't matter to the Blood God. Take his skull. I force the voice away, silencing its pleas with all my will. It is not easy, but my mind is trained in resisting the temptation of bloodshed. Oh yes it is. The demon goes silent, and the pain starts to come back, but I welcome the change. The pain of the nails is familiar, at least. As I turn my attention back to my surroundings, I see Alexandra getting closer. He is holding his weapon with both of his hands, and the control I saw in his eyes earlier this day is gone. It is the nails that control him now. His eyes are devoid of any emotion, any thought, any urge save that of killing. This is what a son of Angron looks like when the red veil falls on his eyes, and only blood can lift it. Alexandra wants to kill the quarry, but I cannot let him. He can feel that I am an obstacle on the path of butchery, and it enrages him even further. It won't take long now. My brother attacks, his axe aiming at my throat, seeking to decapitate me in a single blow. He is as fast as any Astartes can be, but to me, it seems that he is going in slow motion. The changes in my body are still in effect, even with Hecaran silenced. I block the attack with my bare hand, catching the blade between my clawed fingers. He tries to pull the weapon back to him, but I hold it in place. Shock finds its way on his face through the bloodlust. He dared to attack me? We must destroy him. I am his brother. We will take his skull for that. Has our legion already fallen so low? We are no longer of the world eaters. We are of the forsaken sons. My right hand rises, still holding my own chain axe. I cannot stop it. Alexandra sees it, and begins to push at his weapon with all his strength trying to force his way through. The urge to kill is back, overwhelming my senses. The pain, the voice, they are both here, and I have no order to oppose them, no reason that may stall my, our hand. Valens gasped as he saw the towering monstruosity cleaves its own comrade apart. Astarte's blood spilled on the ground, burning through the pavement of the street. His mind reeled, failing to accept what he had seen. He knew, on some intellectual level, that Astartes had killed Astartes in the past. But it was something entirely different to witness such an utter betrayal with his own eyes. In a way, it was even worse than watching his planet die. This was the death of brotherhood, of all that the Imperium had ever stood for. This was the ultimate proof that the rebellion had been in the wrong, for even their own ranks were afflicted with fratricide. You will not touch this man, or we will take your skulls ourselves. Are we clear? The beast roared and the rest of the world eaters scattered back amidst the ruins, no doubt seeking easier prey. Valens hated himself for the hint of relief that he felt at the sight. It would have been better to die there and now, he repeated to himself. Do not be so certain about that, mortal, said the demonic Astartes as if it had read his thoughts. The warborn are crowding this world. If you were to die here, your soul would be claimed by them, and only torment would await you. Enjoy your continued existence for as long as Arkan allows you to keep it. Valence didn't answer the creature. How was this possible? Had the monster read his mind? Was it a psyker? As he pondered these questions, Valence heard a sound he had not forgotten, the sound of an Astartes aircraft incoming. The last time he had heard it had been when the Iron Hands had reinforced the position where he had been injured. This wouldn't be such a joyous occasion, of that he was certain. A thunderhawk wearing the livery of the Sons of Horus landed amidst the ruins, its pilot expertly dodging the larger pieces of rubble. Its engine slowed down but didn't stop. Valens recognized this for what it was, the sign that the craft was here for a pickup in hostile zone, and not intending to remain here for any longer that was needed. The door of the craft's bay opened, and Valens laid the eyes on the being responsible for the destruction of his world. Next to him, the monstruosity bowed its head to its lord in sign of respect. We should kill him. He is strong. He deserves our allegiance. The anathema was strong, too. It is different. He is our brother, 
not some distant, treacherous, cowardly bastard. We are the destroyers of worlds. We should not bow before anyone. He owns my loyalty, demon. He earned it. So did Alexandra. Will he meet the same fate? I ignore the demon's further taunts, and focus on my lord. He is not alone, of course. Domerian and the rest of his Terminator guards stand at his side. That much is to be expected, after all, he is walking a war zone. Even the Primarchs take guards with them on the battlefield, if only for the sake of appearances. Only Angron didn't. The Devourers, who should have assumed this function, were never more than a joke at the expense of the Legion's best warriors. They are all dead now, ripped apart on terror. I remember seeing them die. Some of them fell to the Imperial Fist's guns, most, to Angron's own axe. Arkan is bareheaded. I have not seen him wear his helmet since the events on Ilias. I have heard rumors aboard the ship, though. The crew whips us that our lord hears the voices of the warp, and that if he was to don his helmet, the voices would overwhelm him. My lord walks to the remnants of Alexandra. He lowers himself, and pick up the former Capain's severed head. As he rises, he holds it aloft, staring in the dead eyes of my brother. Ah, Alexandra, he says, his voice as emotionless as ever. I had such hopes for you, but it seemed you weren't the one. He drops the head, and turns to me. He is smaller than I. And what is your name, warrior? I force myself to speak alone, banishing the demon's influence on my voice. I am Hector, Lord. Hector, he repeats, nodding to himself as if recognizing my name. Yes, I remember that name. He approaches, and turns around me. I stay immobile but I cannot stop a nervous spasm when I feel his armored hand stroking my wings. An image flashes before my eyes, I see him ripping my wings off, and vanish the moment he takes his hand away. He circles all around me and faces me again. Once more, he nods to himself, before looking at the quarry. A dead smile appears on his lips. You found him, I see. Good. He lifts the mortal as if he waited nothing, and peers into the old man's eyes. Despite the pain that robs him of the ability to speak, the former governor still radiates defiance and rage. My lord examines the augmentics that make almost half the man's body, noticing that the arm has been ripped off. Mercurian, he says in his vox. I have found him. He is alive, but, damaged. I do not hear the reply, but I know the Margus isn't pleased at the news. Yes, he answers. All the parts are here, at least. I will make sure they are brought to you. He gestures at the torn metal arm on the ground, and one of the Terminators takes up the piece of machinery. The Astartes then walks to my lord, and relieves him of the quarry. The prey has fallen unconscious, the pain finally forcing his brain to black out. I am envious of that. There is no escape from the butcher's nails. Sleep is denied to us, and the only oblivion we can find is that of death. The nails do not let us fall for any other reason. Arkan turns back to me. The demon in me feels his satisfaction, even though nothing on his face betrays it. He knew. He knew what would happen. I agree with Hector Arnold that is the only possibility. My lord knew that one of the world eaters would receive the blessing of the Empyrean. He thought it would be Alexandra? That fool was unworthy of such a blessing. Offering his skull to corn is honor enough for him. But how could he know? I feel the demon prying into my mind looking for information. When it finds out what it is looking for, it is not happy. Sorcery. Cowardice. He is unworthy. I feel my armed hand rise without my command, and I struggle to stop it, but the demon is too strong. Arkan bodyguards aim their weapons at me, I cannot blame them for that. Only a firm command of their lord stops them from opening fire. Arkan looks at me, unmoving, as if wanting to see how far I will go. I gather all of my will and stop the chain axe, blocking the weapon in place. Let me kill him. He is weak. Those who need to use sorcery are unworthy of our allegiance. I fight, with all my will, trying to put the weapon down, but the demon and I are of equal force, and the chain axe stays immobile. Then, my lord speaks. You will not harm me, nor anyone under my survey, Hecaran. The demon releases its hold on my body, and I can hear it screaming in rage and disbelief. My lord knows its name, and thus can command it. No doubt he learnt it in the oracle's chamber, and to be defeated in such a way only furthers the rage of the devil in my soul. 
I bow my head to my lord in wordless thanks. He nods, then turns toward the aircraft, gesturing for his guards to follow. Halfway, he stops, and looks back at me. Your brothers are still out there? I nod in answer. He knows what they are doing, of course. They're killing. That is the Twelfth Legion's way, the only one we know. Would you rather come back to the ship with us, or stay here? The second phase of the invasion will start soon. The second phase, I remember it from the briefings. Now that the Imperial forces are leaderless, Arkan will send packs to high-value targets, with orders to loot everything that can be of use. These places may be defended yet. They may provide the opportunity of a worthy battle. Here, there are only defenseless civilians waiting to be butchered. My brothers could spend days hunting them, indulging their bloodlust, until the nails release them and they can be taken back to the Hand of Ruin. They are useless to him now, a one-use weapon in the campaign that has just begun. That battle is not worth fighting. True enemies await for us elsewhere on this world. Hecaran speaks once more, drawn from its brooding by the perspective of battle. I agree with it. True battle awaits us elsewhere. We will come with you, and aid in the conquering of this world, me and the demon say together. After all, we both want the same thing. Blood. Blood for the blood god. The possessed marine followed his lord in the Thunderhawk. Sitting at the command station, Perseus felt himself starting to sweat. The creature they had picked up alongside the governor had an unnerving presence, to say the least. Perseus understood that the Astartes needed every weapon they could use, and the warp touched were powerful weapons indeed, but, it seemed too dangerous to use them. They bore within them the very monsters that had made the Exodus such an hellish journey. Not that he would dare to say that out loud, of course. He may be the favorite pilot of the Awakened One's chief bodyguard, but he would still die the moment he doubted the Lord's decisions. He flew the craft back to the ship without incident. Valen's flesh eye opened slowly, pain forcing him back into the realm of the living. He tried to move his head, but found out it was held in place by metal restraints. All his limbs were similarly bound. You are awake. Good. The procedure cannot be complete if you are not awake to report your sensations during the extraction. The voice was cold, metallic and entirely devoid of feeling. Valens knew that kind of voice, though this one had a hint of something far more sinister behind it, this was the voice of a tech priest. In the dim light, the former governor saw his jailer. I am dead, he thought. I am dead and the church was right, there is an hell after all. The creature had the visage of a demon, crafted in adamantium and looking at him with luminous, red eyes. A set of mechadendrites rose from its back, clacking and twisting as if hungry for his blood. Now, let the experiment begin. He missed dreaming. Not that he had ever had pleasant dreams, of course. But he had never realized how much more sleep was than just the recovery of one's physical stamina. Dreams help to organize one's thoughts, to put things behind you and to go forward. But he couldn't dream. His muscles were fueled by a seemingly endless flow of stamina, and sleep was not only unneeded, but impossible for him. And while the advantages of that, gift, he supposed he should say, were quite considerable, sometimes not being able to sleep something off could be annoying. Leaving the oracle's chamber with visions of the warp engraved in his mind was definitely one of these times. Serek Sithar couldn't stop him from taking what he wanted, but the demon could make it difficult. He was suffering a tremendous headache, and images danced before his eyes that do not belong to this side of hell. Lord Awakened, greeted Asim. Are you all right? I will be. How long was I in there, brother? It was hard, almost impossible to keep track of time in the chamber. Even his armor's chronometer went crazy in the room filled with the emanations of the warp. That was why he ensured that a member of the coven was waiting for him every time he visited the captive demon prince. Using them like this was a waste of their capabilities, but he wasn't going to let anyone else near the oracle. The risks were too great. Still, it had surprised him when the leader of the coven himself had volunteered for the task this time. Arsim could easily had asked one of his brothers to do it, it was what hierarchies were for. Did the Thousand Sun want to speak with him away from prying ears? You have stayed in the chamber for three hours, forty-seven minutes and twenty seconds, answered Darsim. I know we say that to you every time, but you really shouldn't spend so much time with that creature. Interaction with its kind only ever serves their goals, finished Arkin, who had heard the warning the exact same number of times he had gone to consult the Oracle. Yes, I know. 
but it is one of our greatest assets, Arsim. The sorcerer shrugged, the movement of his muscles amplified by his power armor. It is my job to warn you, he said, dropping the subject. Did you at least find what you were looking for? Arkan looked at his brother, and his lips twitched into the dead smile that had become his only facial expression, with the rage he had unleashed at the late Alexandra, the space marine could make. Oh, yes, he whispered. I have found that indeed. Walk with me, brother, said the awakened while starting to march toward the command deck. The thousand sun followed his lord without question. They walked for a moment in silence, then Arkan asked, So, what did you want to talk to me about? Arsim wasn't surprised by his lord's insight about the reason he had volunteered himself for the tedious duty of guarding the chamber and counting the minutes. Even without the demon's help, he had always had a keen mind. It is about the members of my legion, he said. There is, something going on in the warp. I wanted to ask you before you entered the chamber, but I, I suppose I was afraid of what Serexith R would reveal. What exactly is troubling you and your brothers? It happened three nights ago. We felt a, change in our soul, Lord. The flesh change that has plagued our legion since its very foundation has, stopped. Well, that is good news, isn't it? I remember hearing you mourning the loss of every single brother of yours that succumbed to it during the Siege of Terror. Yes, but we do not know why, and that's what worry us. We do not know what's preventing our degeneration, nor if it will last. Arkan looked at the helmeted face of his subordinate, seemingly seeing straight through the Ceramite and into the sorcerer's mind. You are afraid that your Primarch has made another deal with the Octid. That he has sold something else to the Architect of Fate in return for his son's salvation. Arsim nodded. His next words were laced with bitterness. I do not even know the details of the first deal he made when he saved us from the flesh change after the Emperor found him. I do not know those of the second, made when Prospero burned, either, only that it binds us to the service of the Lord of Change. And now he may have made a third. Me and my brothers aren't afraid, Arkin. We are terrified. Terrified of what it means for us and for our brothers on the planet of sorcerers. Arkan stopped, and looked at his brother. Sarexithar showed me your legion's fate, Arsim. This wasn't what I was looking for, but it took pleasure to show it to me nonetheless. I know what happened, and I can tell you, if you are willing to hear it. But first, tell me, was any of your brother, altered when the rest of you were released for the flesh change? Arsim looked back at him without a word, and Arkan could almost see the blank look on his face. Apparently no. That is good, I need all sorcerers I can find. Now, do you really want to know? Slowly, Arsim nodded, his hands tightening around his staff. He was scared, the Lord of the Forsaken Sons could see that. But the Sons of Magnus were not the kind to turn from the truth, as unpleasant as it may be. In this, they were similar to the word bearers, who had embraced the Octa despite the darkness its pantheon had promised to mankind. Not that Arkan would ever voice that they were loud, of course. It would enrage both of the two legions' representatives aboard the Hand of Ruin. The word-bearers considered the Thousand Sons to be fools who deluded themselves into thinking they were masters of the Great Ocean, while the Sons of Magnus thought that the warriors of the Seventeenth were fanatics who were willing to enslave themselves to powers they didn't understand. The truth, as always, was something between the two. It is not your father's work that you felt through the warp but your brother's. Araman found a way to save you and used it despite Magnus' warnings. He succeeded, it seems, said Arsim carefully. In a fashion. For every thousand son who was saved, a dozen more were reduced to dust, their souls trapped in their armor, turned into automatons unable to move without the command of one of their still living brothers. Magnus' fury was great, but the architect of fate stopped him from destroying Araman and his co-conspirators. Instead, your brother now wanders in the Eye of Terror, forsaken by his own Primarch. Not a soul in the galaxy knows exactly where he is. The rubric, breathed Arsim, staggering from the revelation. He had told me about it before we left for Terror, once our father had chosen his side in the rebellion. He said that once perfected, it would free us from the random mutations. Well, it did. It is quite surprising that none of your brothers on board were destroyed by it, though. Arkan didn't really care about the reason, only the result, but giving Arsim a mystery to think of would bring his mind away from the horror of his legion's fate. It worked. The awakened one could almost see the gears of the thousand sons' well-trained mind starting to turn. 
The spell must have had a different effect depending on the subject's strength. My brothers among us were already, purged by the exodus. Those who survived it must have been strong enough to endure whatever the rubric did to them. But really, only one Astartes out of twelve survived? Arkan shrugged. I don't know the real ratio, Arsim. The visions of the oracle aren't that precise. But I think it is a good estimate. For all it is worth, I am sorry. And he was. The 15th Legion had been one of the most powerful of those siding with the War Master, despite their crippling when Prospero had been destroyed. Their sorcery was a potent weapon, and one that could have been put to great use against the Imperium in the Long War, as he had heard some of his brothers call the continuation of Horus Rebellion. Now, although the Legion of Magnus would be spared collapsing from the mutations, it was also reduced to a handful of true Astartes, on the verge of extinction. That was a real shame. That the architect of fate had allowed this to happen to the Legion that had sworn itself to his service only proved that one had to be careful when dealing with the Chaos Gods. They were powerful, almost limitlessly so, but they were also fickle and whimsical, or at least appeared that way from the point of view of their followers. I, thank you for telling me that, Arkan, said Arsim at last, and the use of his name told the commander that his brother meant it. This truth, however troubling it may be, is still better than the blades of doubt. Arkan didn't say anything in response. They kept on walking, and finally arrived near the command deck. The heavily reinforced door was covered in arcane sigils put in place during the exodus to protect this most critical section of the ship and guarded by two Astartes. One wore the livery of the Iron Warriors, the other the colors of the Emperor's children. Arkan was pleased to see that, at last, some of the packs were learning to work together. The two warriors bowed to the Lord of the Forsaken Sons, and the door opened. Arkan and the leader of the coven passed through, acknowledging the guards with a nod, and entered the Hand of Ruin's command deck. The place was bustling with activity, reports coming from the packs deployed on the world below alongside with demands for pig's feed and additional prime was beaten, but, as the Space Marines had discovered, plundering a world with any efficiency was almost as complex as conquering it. Since he had picked up Hector and the former governor a week ago, Arkan had dispatched almost 300 Astartes on the planet. They had secured landing zones for the aircrafts of the warband, and begun to bring in spoils to be brought aboard the Hand of Ruin. The gunships were being reduced to simple carriers, but it was for a good cause. Besides, they had already captured five shuttles from the planet that were unfit for Astartes' deployment, but perfect for that kind of dull work. Already, empty storage rooms on the ship were beginning to fill with the product of Mueller Prime's ransacking. He had sent others to the rest of the system, with specific orders. Arkan had planned for this campaign during the weeks in warp transit, and he didn't intend to let anything of value slip from his fingers. The Forsaken Sons would bleed the Mueller system dry and leave stronger than ever. To this end, all Astartes deployed had received a list of what the Forsaken Sons could use from the planet. Navigators. Astropaths. Sanctioned and rogue psychers alike. Mortal possessing useful skills. Supplies and weapons of any kind. Young males that were strong enough to endure the implantation process that would make them into new Astartes. Servitors that could be reprogrammed to serve the warband. Some of the strongest rioters, to be trained and armed in order to form a semblance of mortal army. Riches, too, in the form of jewels or precious metal, plundered from the highest towers of the hive world where its most privileged citizens had lived. Arkan wouldn't have thought of the last one himself, but an Alpha Legion warrior had suggested it to him, saying that it could help them if they were one day brought to dealing with mortals. With most military forces on the planet utterly destroyed by the riots and the World Eaters beheading strike against their command, the Pax competed for the Awakened One's favor by doing all they could to increase their own tribute. Mercurian had sent some of his adepts to keep track of what was entering the ship's coffers and which pack had sent it. There was no official competition going on, nor any reward promised, but the Astartes still did their best at what was essentially an entirely new exercise to them. They were soldiers and warriors, instruments of death and destruction. They weren't pirates, but they were doing a fine job of it nonetheless. But despite the Astartes' newfound talent for looting, things weren't just running smoothly. Even as Arkan just entered the room, the crew turned to him and presented him with a dozen requests for his intervention in situations that demanded his authority, packs on the verge of fighting each other for the same prize, mostly, a warrior of the Night Lords needing to be reminded that he wasn't on the planet to torture its people, and, yes, 
Here it was, the one request that he had known would be waiting, the one which was, despite all appearances, an opportunity for the war band. He took care of the others first. He ordered the warriors to start cooperate and share the loot if they were really that serious, gave a word bearer demagogue his permission to start preaching to the rioting masses, and told the night lord to stop his attics, there would be plenty of time for enjoyment once the planet had been stripped bare of all that could be useful. Then, he opened a Vox connection to the pack of former sons of Horus who had asked for the Awakened One's advice on a sensible matter. This is Arkan of the Hand of Ruin. Speak up, Lucian. Lord Awakened, came the answer, blurred by static yet still understandable. We have been awaiting you for an hour. There was no critic in the Marine's voice, only mild curiosity and a hint of stress. I was occupied. Describe your situation. I have nine brothers with me, two of them wounded. We are at the base of one of the city's spires, where this world's so-called elite was inhabiting. There are still people inside, and they are well defended. Describe the defenses, Order Darkin. They have at least a hundred private soldiers in here, just at the entrance, equipped with weapons capable of piercing our armor. The ground here is covered in the bodies of the looters who tried to make a run for it. We could take them, but the simple charge to reach them would cost us, and doubtlessly there are more inside. Since you ordered us not to risk our lives unless we had no choice, I sent a request for your advice. Yes, Arkan thought. This was what he had seen in the chamber. The richest clan of this planet and the one family of rulers that had escaped purging when the Imperium had reclaimed the world, the Sertanoff had survived by turning against the other dynasties, sacrificing much of their power and resources in the War of Compliance. For this, they had been spared, though reduced to a simple merchant house. It had helped that they were considered one of the least ruthless bloodlines of Mueller Prime's overlords, at least that was the reason given in Imperial records. Arkan knew the true reason the Sertanoff had been spared, however. It was simple and crude, as befitting of base humans, bribing. The Sertanoff have paid the Adeptus Administratum accompanying the expeditionary fleet an obscene amount in return for their pardon, and it had been enough to forget millennia of exploitation and tyranny. The bureaucratic worms had been very efficient in their rewriting of history, to the point that even the people of the world had truly believed that the Sertanoff had been paragons of virtue and righteousness in a world filled with greed and corruption before the warp storm and the forsaken suns destroyed their society. The iterator's manipulation skills could be frightening, sometimes. How typical of the Imperium, Arkan thought. This was all that the false emperor built upon the foundations crafted by Astarte's sacrifices, lies and deceit and the foolish masses of humanity gobbled it all, starving for his lies as much as the world eaters did for blood. This was what had led the Warmaster to turn from his father and launch his own crusade to claim the galaxy for the warriors who had fought to conquer it. And yet, here laid an opportunity. The Saturnoff had been forced to abandon their ancestral keep when they had switched sides, but they had rebuilt it nearly perfectly in the new hive cities, away from the centers of power. They had also reclaimed much of their former wealth and power over the decades, carefully hiding some of their more shady activities from the governor's eyes. In both legal and illegal dealings, the Sertanoff have become one of the most powerful forces of Mueller Prime's economy. Arkan knew this thanks to Serik Sithar's visions, but also simply because he had spent hours reading the data on the cogitators they had seized from the local administratum and arbits. The fact that no one else had apparently noticed the evidence of the Sertanoff's crimes in the official records indicated that the family hadn't abandoned the practice of bribing. And why should have they, when it had worked so well for them? Pressing a few buttons on the hololithic view, Arkan brought up the image of the Sertanoff spire. It wasn't a beautiful thing, at least not in his eyes. Protected from orbital bombardment by a void shield that had been activated the moment the storm had reached Mueller Prime, which was very illegal in itself, the tower was almost three kilometers high. It had endured the destruction that rampaged through the city, which was a little miracle. That miracle owed much to the squads of mercenaries and thugs that the Sertanoff kept in their fortress and as much to the fact that the spire wasn't located with the rest of the Highborn's demons. In fact, the fortress was almost a city in itself isolated from the rest of the world and nearly self-sufficient, with thousands of people living their entire lives within its walls. There had been no plan of its insides in the cadaster, which must have cost another bribe to the family. The bottom of the spire was heavily fortified indeed. 
Lucian couldn't hope to assault it with only his squad, in fact, attacking the spire with anything less than a full company worth of space marines would be painfully difficult and slow. But Arkan didn't intend to attack. Lucian, he voxed. I am coming down to your location with reinforcements. Do not do anything that may provoke the humans. I want to talk to them. Acknowledged, awakened one. The sergeant cut the vox link. Arkan opened another. Techno adept. I need something from you. Ask, commander. The Omnisire shall provide. Tell me, Merchurian. How advanced are the repairs on that suit of tactical dreadnought armor? Sergeant Lucian didn't enjoy waiting. He understood the tactical necessity of it, of course, but he still didn't like it. His squad, he refused to think of it as a pack as did others in the warband, for his brothers had been fighting alongside him far before they joined the Hand of Ruin, didn't like it either. Since coming down on this dying world, they had been aching for a decent fight, and now that it seemed that one was finally being presented, the ache had become even more unnerving. They weren't world eaters, but they wanted to fight. They were born and bred for war, and only on the battlefield could they fulfill their purpose. Looting this planet was an interesting and novel experience, but it couldn't compare to the exultation of glorious warfare. He longed to put his bolter to use against a worthy opponent, to test his mettle and that of his brothers against an enemy able to fight back, to prove his value to the one who had dragged him and the rest of the warband out of the pit of despair and self-pity they had been trapped in after the warmaster's death. All of Lucian's squadmates had followed his example and richly repainted the emblem of their legion in black, but true loyalty and might could only be proven by war. Yet, the last order of their lord, to not do anything that may provoke the mortals cowardly hiding in the tower, made Lucian unsure whether or not there would be any fight at all. It seemed that the Awakened One had a plan, and it probably didn't involve killing those annoying pests. A shame, that, but, well, duty was duty. And Arkan had said that he would bring reinforcements, so perhaps he was reading too much into this and there would be a battle after all. Sergeant, said his brother Merck. When do we attack? If and when the Awakened One orders us to. Now shut up and wait. He shouldn't be long. As if one cue, the sound of a thunderhawk pierced the background of screams and destruction that shrouded the entire ruined city. Arkan's personal aircraft was incoming. Of all the gunships, this one was the only one which had been spared from being used as a transport for the Astartes spoils, precisely in case the Awakened One needed to get down fast. The Hand of Ruin did have a teleportarium, but no one would be foolish enough to use it when they were still in a bloody warp storm. No matter how much Merchurian insisted that he had perfectioned the device with the blessings of the Omnisire revealed by the blood spilled in his name, whatever that meant, to make sure it didn't destroy anyone utilizing it. The craft landed, and Lucian once more wondered where exactly that bastard Demerian had found that mortal who was allowed to pilot the Awakened One's own aircraft. His gift at piloting the Thunderhawk bordered on the preternatural, surpassing most of the space marines Lucian knew. Favorite of Demerian or not, only the mortal's skills made him valuable to the warband, and he was one of the most valuable of the small mortal crew remaining on the ship. That could change soon, though. The slaves taken aboard the Hand of Ruin would be examined, those already possessing useful skills put to work and those physically apt would undergo the hypno-learning that would give them the skills needed to work for the Forsaken Sons. Those who were unable would probably be used as the material for servitors, or herded as cannon fodder for the following campaigns of the warband. Perhaps one of these new slaves would prove a better pilot than Demarion's little pet. Seeing the Thunderhawk perfect landing, though, Lucian knew it was highly unlikely. Then the door of the craft opened, and all thoughts of the mortal were swept away from his mind. Lord Arkan had abandoned his old power armor. Instead, he wore a complete set of Terminator armor, freshly repaired and repainted in the black of the Forsaken Sons, with a stylized demonic face surrounded by a circle of chain painted in gold on the breastplate. His left arm ended up in a combi bolter, and the other was equipped with a lightning claw. He was bareheaded, his bald, scarred skull exposed to the winds of the ever-raging storm. Looking at his lord, Lucian felt as if he was looking at the future of all space marines of the traitor legions, a warrior who didn't care about the bloodline of those serving under his command, so long as they were efficient. A being clad in the darkness of death and vengeance, harnessing the power of chaos to wield it against the Imperium. For a moment, he thought he saw someone else in his lord's place, someone even more powerful and tall, 
with a single knot of hair rising from his head and holding in his hand a sword that could slay entire stars while the other supported claws that could rend the flesh of demigods. The vision was a thing of absolute terror, a being whose name was whispered in abject fear by trillions of souls and who was responsible for such destruction and death that it made Horus' rebellion pale. Then the moment was gone, and he went to his knee before the Lord awakened. He saw Damarian and the rest of Arkan's bodyguards getting out of the Thunderhawk first, and gritted his teeth under his helmet at the sight of his brother. Ah, Lucian, he heard Damarian calling him on a private Vox channel. Still hiding behind walls and calling for help at the first difficulty, aren't you? You didn't learn anything since Istvan. The sergeant bit down a reply, and severed the link with a blink of his eye. He could have sworn hearing a grunt of agreement from the machine spirit of his armor as it cut the communication. The power armor had changed since his legion had turned from the false emperor, the gifts of the octid and the enhancements of the mechanicum priests had altered it. It was alive now, turned into a ravenous predator who sought the fires of war as a starving man would seek food. And, just like the one who wore it, it loathed Damarian with a passion. That hatred had its roots on the events of Istvan, when the sons of Horus, Death Guard, Emperor's Children and World Eater's Legions had purged their own ranks of the cowards and weak-willed before dealing a near-fatal blow to the Raven Guard, the Salamanders and the Iron Hands. On the battlefield of Istvan III, Lucian had been part of the force tasked with finishing their misguided brothers hiding in the ruins of the burned world. He had led a full-strength tactical squad with him, twenty battle brothers loyal to the War Master. They had fallen into a trap. The loyalist emperor's children had caught them perfectly in a crossfire, and he had lost half his men before reaching a position where they could hide and call for reinforcements. It had been Damarian's men who had rescued them, and the captain hadn't wasted a single opportunity to remind him of that fact in the years that had passed since. Countless times, he had had to repay the favor he owed the captain. It had come to the point he wished the bastard hadn't shown up, then to the point when he wanted to kill him. Some part of him still thought it strange that he hated his own battle brother and superior for such a petty reason, but every time these thoughts started to surface, his armor pumped his body full of stimulants that drove him to further heights of cold, bitter anger. Lord Arkan, he said, bowing his head to the master of the Forsaken Sons. We await your orders. Stand by here for now. You too, Damarian. I am going alone. Then, to the marine's surprise and dawning horror, the awakened one started walking straight toward the certain off spire. Demarion and Lucian both started to move to follow, before years of training reasserted themselves and stopped them. Arkan noticed their move, however, and said, Do not worry, brothers. I know what I am doing. Arkan wasn't used to wearing a Terminator armor. As a superior officer, he had been trained in using one when they had first been introduced into the legions, of course, but that had been decades ago, and even an eidetic memory didn't make up for years of habit in using his traditional Mark V power armor. The suit weighted heavily on him despite the inner engines, and slowed every cinch move he attempted to make. And yet, there was no denying the sensation of power brought by the near invulnerability the suit granted to its wearer. The Terminator armor Arkan was wearing had once belonged to a warrior of the Fourth Legion. The Iron Warrior had died in battle against the Ultramarines on the Hand of Ruin, and his armor had been reclaimed and repaired by Merchurian subordinates. The Techno-Adept himself had directed the major part of the repairs, as Arkan had asked for a suit of tactical dreadnought armor to be prepared for him shortly after the capture of Serex Ithar. According to the priest, the machine spirit of the suit had been, surprised. It hadn't expected to be salvaged from destruction. Both Merchurian and Arkan were still unsure what exactly that meant. What in the name of the Warmaster did the Iron Warriors do with their precious equipment for this armor to expect being scraped after its previous wearer's death? The armor had also been repainted. Arkan had long lingered on what color scheme to use. The one of his own legion? But that would be a sign that he still clung to his bloodline, while he had claimed to have risen above it. As leader of the Forsaken Sons, he had to show them the way into the future he had envisioned for them. The answer had come to him during one of his visits to Sarek Sathar's cell. He had seen a legion that would one day burn the Imperium to ashes, uniting the forces of chaos in one single great horde that would be utterly unstoppable. He wasn't the one to lead it, he wasn't arrogant enough to believe it, despite Sarek Sathar's attempts to convince him that it was possible. But the colors of that great horde had inspired him. Black, for the sins and failures of their fathers. 
gold, for the dawn of a new future that they would carve across the Imperium. He hadn't completely replicated the heraldry of the Great Host, but he had kept the colors it used. His standard armor was being repainted at that very moment, so that he would always bear what was to be the emblem of the Forsaken Sons. The demonic head was his own little joke at Serex Ithar's expense. No one would get it outside of his warband, but the scream of indignation of the demon when it had felt his intent had been, gratifying. As the Space Marine advanced, the defenders of the Spire began to open fire on him. Their shot bounced against his armor, harmless. A few shots aimed at his bare head may have hurt him, but Mercurian had included a miniature force field to the armor that protected his exposed skull. He kept on walking, unfazed by the assault. As he progressed, he gathered momentum, and was able to go faster and faster. A few dozens of seconds later, he crashed through the fortified wall of the spire, knocking back the men guarding the other side. In the dust his arrival had risen, he scanned the base of the spire, his transhuman vision piercing the cloud. Lucian's estimation had been right, almost a hundred men had been sent here, to guard the entrance of the tower from assault. The first level of the spire had been turned into a fortress, to defend the access to the rest. There were cover points and automated turrets scattered on the vast space, all to defend the one access to the upper level, a single, massive elevator at the center of the room that could easily transport fifty mortal men. Arkan looked down at his foot, and saw one of the mercenaries trying to get up. The man was wearing a full-body armor and holding a custom bolt pistol with both hands. His helmet wore the crest of an officer. Good. The marine lowered his right hand, deactivating the current in his lightning claw with a thought, and picked the man up, rising him so that they were face to face. The man trashed in vain, trying to escape the avatar of death that had just crossed through the defenses effortlessly. Calm down, little man, and tell your comrades to do the same. I am not here to kill you. I am here to make an offer to your master. Mitslav Nikifa Sertanov, Patriarch of House Sertanov, sat in his throne on the 195th level of the Sertanov Spire. This was the floor where his family conducted its audience with those who were deemed worthy of stepping so close of the final floors, where the members of the bloodline spend most of their lives. It was the only place he could think of that would be the least possibly insulting to the demigod he was going to meet. Mitslav was, by most standards, an old man though rejuvenation treatments hid that well. His long, black hair was only scarcely colored by gray, and his face still looked like that of a man several decades younger. In his ceremonial attire, all green and red silk, he knew he looked very regal, very imposing. Not that it would make any impression on the visitor, but it helped his own confidence. Mitslav had been on Mueller Prime when it had been conquered by the Imperial Expeditionary Fleet. It was him who had convinced his family to side with the Imperium after putting a bullet in the skull of his father himself. The old fool had wanted to fight to the death, when clearly, they stood absolutely no chance of winning. The Imperium had thousand, perhaps even millions of world under its control. They had technologies that had thought to be long forgotten, and armies beyond numbers. They couldn't be beaten. By siding with the Imperium, they had had a chance of survival. And survival, in the end, was all that mattered. Wealth and influence could be rebuilt existence couldn't. When he had seen the warriors of the Legion Astartes unleashed against the other ruling families, he had known for certain that he had made the right choice. They had destroyed those who had resisted. The armies of the other families had been broken like helpless puppets before the might of the Emperor's elite, their fortresses torn apart and their members slain or captured to be judged and executed. Mitslav had sacrificed half his family's fortune to buy off the Imperium. But when they had seen the fate of the other bloodlines, his kindred had stopped protesting. It had been worth it. Even the sacrifice of those of the family who were to take the blame for the acts that just couldn't be suppressed had been worth it. That these scapegoats had happened to be Mitslav's most fervent opponents within the family had been a happy coincidence, nothing more, he had ensured the remaining of his family. And now, one of the Astartes was coming, wanting to make a deal with them. When Mitslav had heard that half the legions had turned against the Emperor, led by no other than the Warmaster, he had first thought that someone had poisoned him and that he was going insane. But that had been the truth. The galaxy had been torn by war for years, until Horus' ultimate failure and death on terror. They had been lucky enough to be spared from the war itself. In fact, with most of the local Imperial Guard sent to fight in distant systems, the Sertanov family's shady activities had boomed. 
War always brought opportunity, and Mitslav had been determined to make the most of this one. How often did one have the dubious privilege to live during a galactic civil war? But most of it had been for nothing. The warp storm had destroyed Mueller Prime's society. If the astropaths he kept in the 77th floor were to be trusted, the situation across the rest of the system, or even the whole Trebidius sector, was the same. The only difference was that here, they had renegade space marines to deal with atop everything else. Mitslav had seen the ship that had brought the traitors in the system. One of the satellites he had had sent in orbit for spying on his rivals had managed to catch a single image before being shutting down from the effects of the warp storm. The image had been blurred, but his servants' efforts had made it clear enough for Mitslav to know they were doomed. The ship was a titanic thing, more than ten kilometers long. It had cannons and turrets in enough numbers to bring down an entire fleet of smaller ships, though it was marked by scars and gashes from battles it had had no chance to recover from. It didn't follow any pattern of spacecraft that he or any of the house's savants knew of, but that hardly mattered. The recognition signal it emitted identified it as the Hand of Ruin, of the 16th Legion, the very legion whose Primarch had led the rebellion before failing to see it through. When the warp storm had risen, Mitslav had hoarded as much food, resources and warriors as he could, then closed down the spire and waited for the chaos to calm down. When the Astartes had made planet fall and killed the governor, at least, he supposed the old Iron Teeth was dead, since there had been no word of him since the first drop pods had landed, he had smiled inwardly at the disappearance of the man who had forced his dealings with the Adeptus Administratum to be much more secretive than they had to be. Now, about to face the being who claimed to lead the hundred of space marines who were looting the world, he was simply terrified. The officer who had contacted him from the base of the spire had relayed the space marines' words very clearly despite his evident terror. The demigod wanted to meet the patriarch of House Sertanov to make him an offer, and if he refused to meet him, refused his offer, or tried to double-cross him, a thousand Astartes would tear down the spire and inflict upon him such horrors that the very warp would scream in terror. Having seen what some of the space marines had done across the city, Mitslav had believed every word of it. So, he had ordered the soldiers at the base of the spire to not attack the lone assailant, much to their relief he suspected, and sent down the elevator that would bring the space marine to the audience chamber. Are you really sure about this, Lord? Asked the closest guard, a captain of the house's troops whose name Mitslav, if he had ever known it, couldn't remember. Mitslav had deployed thirty of the elite mercenaries in the room, though he doubted they would serve as anything but meat shields if the Astartes decided to attack. We can still cut off the elevator's cables. Even a space marine wouldn't survive the fall. And neither would we survive the unleashing of the Astartes' wrath, said the Patriarch, not even bothering to hide the contempt in his voice. Leave these decisions to your superiors and focus on your duty, Captain. Yes, my lord, muttered the man. Mitslav straightened on his throne and faced the entrance of the audience room. As if on cue, the heavy doors opened, revealing the marine in terminator armor that waited behind. The Patriarch didn't recognize the color pattern of the armor. Black and gold, with an hellish visage painted on the front, and no legion emblem at all? The demigod moved forward, until he was only a few meters away from Mitslav. When he spoke, his voice didn't carry any aggressivity yet it seemed to promise death and ruin to all who would be foolish enough to ignore it. Mitslav Nikifa Sertanov. I am Arkan the Awakened One, sworn enemy of the Imperium of the False Emperor, Lord of the Forsaken Sons, commander of the Vessel Hand of Ruin, bringer of the Storm and Bane of the Oracle. He didn't bow, though Mitslav hadn't expected him to. He probably couldn't with that armor on anyway. Mitslav nodded to the armored giant, and did his best to keep his fear hidden. He didn't think that the Astartes was dupe, but he needed to keep face. Lord Arkan. It is an honor to finally meet you face to face. He gestured toward one of the servants, who was holding a trail of cups filled with one of the many priceless drinks House Sertanoff's cellar contained. Would you care for a drink? It was a calculated risk. He knew that the Space Marine scarcely needed to eat or drink, and with that armor on, the visitor couldn't possibly take up a glass but to pretend to follow the basics of etiquette in spite of the situation would make him look more confident, and that was always a good thing in a negotiation. Not that there would be any actual negotiation taking place. Mitslav wasn't a fool. If the Space Marine had an offer that didn't involve him and all of House Sertanov dying, he would take it and thanks whatever gods ruled this mad galaxy. 
The giant smiled, a sight that sent shivers down Mitzlaf's spine, so unnatural and utterly devoid of emotions it looked, and actually picked up one of the glass between two of the claws that ended his right hand. He lifted it to his lips and drank, the deadly weapons mere inches away from his face. One false move would have, if not killed him, at least disfigured him, yet the warrior didn't appear concerned by the insane risk he was taking. The mortals in the room froze at the casual display of the warrior's control over his weapons. He put down the goblet, and gestured for the servant to go away. The woman left the Astarte's side with steps that were not quite running, but almost a fine drink, patriarch, said Arkan in a conversational tone. Now, let us get to the business at hand. As I said to your man, I have an offer for you. I am impatient to hear it, answered Mitslav. Mueller Prime is defenseless and in ruins. There is almost nothing left on this world that has any value to me and my brothers. But it is not so for you. This planet, and one hundred more, are cut from the Imperium. By my hand, the storm was unleashed that plunged the entire sector into darkness. It will last for decades, for centuries. Perhaps, if we feed it, for all eternity. My offer is this, I would give you this world, midst love of House Certinoff. I would grant you full authority over it and all of those who draw breath under its burning skies, released from the yoke of the false emperor's hypocrite kingdom. I would make you a king, more powerful than any of your forebears has ever been. If you would bow down to me and accept me as your lord liege, I would make it so that you would appear a savior to the remnants of this planet's population. You would be the one having bargained with the tyrannic demigod, offering his own life in exchange for me sparing them, only for me to force you to servitude. I would send you supplies from the agri world that turns around this system's star, that you would give to the survivors. I would make you their god, Mitzlav. Arkan walked closer to the patriarch, leaning toward the man. You are an old man, Mitzlav. Despite the rejuvenating treatments, your life is nearing its unavoidable end. I would release you even from this. I have access to technology far beyond that which your backwater world can ever hope to furnish you, meant for the Legion serfs and those of the Adeptus Maconicus who sided with the Warmaster learned much, freed from the false emperor's forbidding decrees. Even beyond that, there are means to defy death that I can show you. When Horus turned from the false emperor, he found allies of immeasurable power, beings of such might that they can only be called gods. These beings have power over life and death, and if you would join me, I would send you one of my brothers who would teach you their ways, that you may court them and ask for this ultimate reward. I have seen it with my own eyes on the walls of terror, Mitzlav, they can make a man immortal, if he proves his worth to them. Kneel before me, and I can give you this chance. And what? asked Mitzlav in a breathless voice, his mind spinning from the possibilities that the Space Marine was presenting to him, would you ask in return? I would ask that you prepare tribute for me and my brethren when we return to this system. I would ask that you spread the faith of the Octid among these people. I would ask that, should Imperial forces somehow find their way to this place, you fight them and call for us should they prove too strong to deal with on your own. And I would ask of one sacrifice as proof of your allegiance. What sacrifice? There is one in your house that caught my attention, Mitzlav. Your grandson, Aloran I think he is called. Unlike most of your bloodline, he is physically fit and young enough. Give him to me, and I shall make him one of us. I shall make him an Astartes, a warrior in the war against the false emperor and his lackeys. He shall brought glory to your house and his sacrifice shall be proof of your devotion to your people's safety in the eyes of these brainless lambs. Now, Mitzlav Nikifa Sertinov. Choose. And know that, if you refuse or break faith with me, you and all of your bloodline shall be utterly destroyed, and your fate whispered about in fear for the rest of eternity. The Patriarch chose, if that could be called a choice. A few minutes later, the awakened one emerged from the spire, a teenage boy following him, fear in his eyes and terror in his body language. Demarion and Lucian bowed to their master's return, surprised at the infant's presence but not willing to comment on it in the other's presence. Arkan looked at his brothers, and saw the tension right between them. He sighed internally. Another problem, another difficulty to take care of before the Forsaken Sons would be ready, a perfect blade to wield against the Imperium in the name of vengeance. It didn't matter. He would keep going on, forging the warband into the instrument of his revenge. There was still much, much to do, even if only in the confines of this star's gravitational reach. The Mueller system still had much to give to them. 
The alliance he had forged this day was but a piece in the plans he had set in motion when the Hand of Ruin had first emerged from the warp. The resources it would bring to the warband would help them, and the potential he had seen that Aloran possessed in the Oracle's chamber would be another asset, if the boy survived the implantation procedure. The next step would be far more challenging than this one had been. Words alone wouldn't be enough, he would have to fight, and doubtlessly brothers would die in the pursuit of his goals. But the potential rewards for it were simply too great to ignore. So, Arkan the Awakened One, Warlord of the Forsaken Sons, walked to the Thunderhawk that waited for him, followed by a band of warriors who shared his blood and owed him their loyalty yet distrusted each other, and the child that was soon to join them, to return to his ship and prepare. C2746 DSS 885 waited for him. The skies of terror were torn by the powers unleashed by the sorcerers of the 15th Legion. The collective psychic might of thousands of gifted souls had crushed the void shields of the Imperial Palace like paper, and bombardment from orbit had ripped the defenses built by Dawn and his sons apart. Now, with the nine legions loyal to the Warmaster having made planet fall, the few of their former brothers who survived in the ruins knew that their doom was at hand. Even as the assailants neared the walls, hordes of demons emerged from the depths of the palace, having broken through the seals that the Emperor had placed there. Entire squads appeared out of thin air, brought from orbit by the sons of Magnus' sorcery. The Cyclops himself appeared, his brother Horus at his side, and together, the two godly beings started to unleash their terrible power on the broken survivors of the Imperial Fists, the White Scars and the Blood Angels, while their allied brothers came down by more conventional means and joined them. Before the Observer's eyes, the winged Primarch fell to the Red Angel's axe, the Lord of Iron took the head of the Praetorian and the Khan was killed by the King of the Knight's Claws, his twin hearts torn from his chest before his few remaining sons. In mere moments, the three loyalist legions were dead, and Horus and his brothers went to confront their father, who was walking toward them at the head of the Custodes who had survived the demon's onslaught. The living gods clashed. The Knight Lords descended in great numbers upon the walls of the Imperial Palace, targeting the Imperial Fists and officers that held the mortal defenders together. Tens of thousands of the Eighth Legion's dreadful warriors had rampaged for days in the cities of the planet, inflicting terrible atrocities on their people and broadcasting their screams to the defenders, taunting them with their impotence at protecting the people of the throne world just as they were powerless to protect the Imperium at large. Several units had succumbed to the provocations and charged the monstrous butchers, and they had died moments later, under the cruel laughter of the Night Lords. The morale of the defenders had been crushed by the Eighth Legion's terror tactics. Now, with the merciless hunt ongoing, the rest of the Warmaster's legions were able to advance. Titans fought each other on the fields of ruins and the corpses of mortal armies torn apart by the legions, and soon, the walls were broken. The legionaries poured through, passing one gate after another, the Primarchs fighting at the side of their sons. Thousands of loyalists fell, the hunters of late Nostromo seeking high priority target, sending ripples of terror among the defenders. The first human units began to turn away, then to run. The Night Haunter himself joined the fray, his brother Dawn reaching through the chaos to fight him, anger overcoming his reason, and the avatar of Fierce the Primarch of the Imperial Fists finishing the breaking of the legion his brother had commanded with the terrible might of his own. The Praetorian's death was the beginning of the end for the loyalists, as more and more traitors joined the fight, titans walking on the ruined walls that had collapsed the moment 8th legion's operatives had sabotaged the void shields. The siege had gone on for years, the skies darkened by thousands of ships. With Gulaman and his legion dead at Kalth, there was no hope of reinforcements coming to the throne world's help and the Warmaster had taken his time mustering his forces for the siege, bombarding the planet for months from orbit with the might of his great fleet. Supplies were running low among the survivors, and some of the Terrans had even begun to turn side and pledge themselves to Horus in return for their survival. All across the galaxy, the Imperium had fallen apart. With no word leaving Terra, the Administratum was unable to function and the war had been all but won, with only the few surviving loyalist Primarchs and whatever remained of their legions with them to try to survive and resist the new order that was slowly building itself upon the Imperium's corpse. Mars had fallen, and the Legio Titanicus of the Red Planet had crossed the void to join in the battle on the ground of the throne world. Hundred of Titans, from the smallest Warhound to the greatest Imperator-class giants, were relentlessly assaulting the void shields of the palace 
kept functioning only by the desperate efforts of those few tech priests who still remained loyal to the false emperor. Then, finally, they fell, as one too many generator broke down under the strain of years of activity. The final assault came, and billions of mortal soldiers, gathered from thousands of world by the word bearers, poured on the walls of the imperial palace, forcing the defenders to waste their few remaining munitions. Behind them, thousand upon thousand of Astartes came, armed and prepared for the ultimate battle. The gates broke under the sheer pressure of numbers, and in moments, the palace was overcome. There was a hissing as the door to the cabin opened, and the tall warrior shut off the hololithic projection as the surf entered the room. My my lord? asked the trembling man. What is it, slave? answered the giant, turning to face the mortal. His voice would have been full of anger if the demigod had any left to spare on such a pathetic wretch. The giant was more than two meters high, and clad in a power armor that had been forged and decorated by the finest artisans of a world he had killed with his own hands, alongside his brothers and Primarch. It was painted in silver and gold, with a spot of black on the shoulder, where the emblem of the warrior's legion had once been. At his waist hung a bolter that he had picked up during the siege. It bore the sigil of the white scars, and he hadn't bothered with changing the emblem. His other weapon was a chainsword that bore no emblem. He had claimed it on the same grounds as the bolter, a nameless tool of war that had been forged in haste in the middle of the war, without time nor care for embellishments. El Lord Karkios. The Awakened One asks for your presence in the Strategium. Karkios, former sergeant of the Fourth Legion, grunted in answer. After turning off the device he had built from spare parts he and his squad had found in the ruins of Mula Prime and that he used for his simulations, he started to walk to the exit of the small room. The slave yelped and jumped out of his way before getting crushed by the Iron Warrior. Ignoring him, Karkios made his way through the corridors of the Hand of Ruin. One did not make the master of the Forsaken Sun's wait. Arkan raised his eyes from the data slate he had been reading when Karkios entered the Strategium. He nodded in salute to the other Astartes, who bowed a lot more deeply in return. Karkios, said the Awakened One. My lord, answered the former Ryan warrior. Tell me, Karkios. Did you try out the hypotheses I gave you? When Karkios had asked for permission to keep some of the cogitators his pack had found on Mueller Prime for his own news, Arkan had demanded him why. Karkios had told him, to replicate the battle for terror, in order to understand what had gone wrong to train his own strategic skills, and to foster the hatred in his heart. Arkan had smiled at the last reason, an ugly sight even for one such as the Iron Warrior, and granted his permission. He had only asked Karkios to use the first simulations to test several assumptions, to see what would have happened if some things had happened differently during the rest of the war. Building the machine had been easy, a mere matter of connecting the cogitators together and linking them to an hololithic table that had been forgotten in one of the secondary stratagems of the Hand of Ruin. Programming it, however, had been a nightmare. He had put into it the basic simulators used sometimes by the Legione Sestartes and the Adeptus Maconicus, but these weren't nearly complex enough to render such a titanic battle, and lacked most of the data needed, as such a battle had never been thought possible before the Warmaster first claimed to rebellion. He had had to scan the ship's memories of the actual battle, and ask warriors of other legions about things that most of them didn't even know they remembered. When asked why he had so many questions about a battle that was long over, he had explained his project. Most had been doubtful, others had laughed in his face. Only telling them that the Awakened One had an interest in the project had kept them answering. Gathering information on the Primarch's own fighting abilities had been especially arduous. Data from engagements prior to the rebellion was all but useless, and the avatars of the Primarchs who had ascended had to be entirely recreated from what little was known of their new powers. Deep down, during the programming, Karkios had come to believe that Magnus hadn't gone all out during the actual battle, it was the only option that made any thrice down sense. But, as with all things of the warp, there couldn't be any certitude. Only supposition and hypotheses. The tests had been an gruesome task. The cogitators had to execute a billion algorithms every second to simulate the outcome of a million different actions, and then project them on the hololithic table. Karkios could have sworn that he had heard the damn thing, the hindsight's mind, as he knew it was being called by others who knew of its existence, when the first simulations crashed in impossible visions. He had seen armies of Primarchs fighting each other, Titans fall under the guns of guardsmen, 
physics being violated in ways that reminded him of the warp, and a hundred other aberrations that had needed to be corrected before the first test had worked out. And the results he had finally obtained had been unambiguous. I have run three scenarios thus far, my lord. In every one of them, we win. Be it the one where Magnus accepts the Optid's help to destroy the Space Wolves before they make planet fall on Prospero, the one where Kurz has all of his legion at his back instead letting it be fractured by his sons while he is hunted aboard the Invincible Reason, the one where the Ultramarines and Gulaman die at Kalth instead of surviving because Lorga sent his most incompetent sons to be culled there, in each of these hypotheses, we win. You are right, my lord, we lost the war because of our father's mistakes. The words were bitter on Karkio's mouth. He had accepted the words of his lord when he had defeated and bound the oracle, of course, but to see the proof that their gene sires were responsible for their failure, to know it to be true, that was a different matter. The awakened one hadn't given any scenario involving Karkio's own primarch, but the former iron warrior knew that this wasn't because Perturabo was blameless. It was to avoid angering him that the master of the Forsaken Sons had spared the Iron Lord from his merciless judgment. Arkan nodded slowly. Karkios caught a glimpse in his eyes, as if he was unsure whether or not to be glad that he had been right. Then, the Lord of the Forsaken Sons shook his head, and focused on the warrior he had summoned. I am glad that your device functions, Karkios, but it isn't the reason I called you here. I require the services of you and your pack. You have a mission for us? asked Karkios. The plunder of Mueller Prime had been terminated when Arkan had made his alliance with the human noble a week ago, and most of the packs were back aboard the Hand of Ruin, mending what little damage their equipment had sustained and counting the spoils. Yes, answered Darkan. Of the four worlds of this system, only one remains untouched by our forces. But it is also the one which will challenge us the most. You were on Mueller Prime, you know how the warp affected its inhabitants. On this world and Mueller Secundus, according to the reports of those of our brothers I have dispatched there, the veil between reality and the Empyrean has grown weaker. And while Mueller Quartum is relatively free of this influence, on Mueller Tertium, that veil has been all but torn apart completely. The Forged World, whispered Karkios. Indeed. The one planet with the most to offer to us, and the one which will be the hardest to tame. I suspect the Warpborn are laughing at that particular joke right now. But it does not matter. We will take what we need from Mueller Tertius, brother. I have a plan, and it requires your help. Why me? Why not any other of the packs? Karkios wasn't trying to refuse the mission, and both space marines knew it. He was genuinely curious. Arkan had a thousand Astartes to choose from, and, though it burnt his pride, the former Iron Warrior knew that many of them surpassed his squad in martial prowess. Thus, there had to be a reason for the Awakened One's choice. All members of the Forsaken Sons had learned, during the Exodus and the events that had followed, that Arkan didn't make any choice without good reasons. The Master of the Forsaken Sons beckoned Karkios to come closer, and began to explain his plan. By the end of the explanation, the son of Olympia knew why he had been chosen. This is going to be really dangerous, brother, concluded Arkan. If you would rather not risk your men, I would understand it. With all due respect, my lord, interrupted Karkios, you are insulting me. We will do it. And we will succeed. Mueller Tertius, pondered Karkios as he and his six brothers descended on the forged world aboard their stormbird in skies choked to death by pollution, was an almost perfect depiction of the myths of hell that had existed on Olympia before the Iron Warriors had burned the world to ashes. Of the twelve forged cities that were on the planet, four had been entirely razed by demonic incursions, the great industrial complex is now craters devoid of life. But the members of the Adeptus Maconicus who had lived there had actually been the lucky ones. The other forges had been claimed by the sentient program that had emerged in the world's cogitators when the warp storm had struck. The machines were now under its control, and those who still lived had been forcefully converted to its cause when their own augmentics had been compromised by the code demon onslaught. All the five forges were now connected by the Warpborn's malign intelligence, in a twisted parody of the Maconicus visions of unity. The roads between these cities were still covered in never-stopping lines of vehicles, but the orbital scans had revealed that both the vehicles themselves and their contents had been altered. Now, constructs of black, bleeding metal carried piles of flesh and iron alike, and one picture in particular, taken through the clouds of dust and ashes that covered the planet's surface most of the time 
had shown that one of the tech priests had merged with the transport, literally achieving the goal of the Adeptus Maconicus of fusion with the machine. While Carcios could admire the achievement of the demon, he felt less than thrilled at the idea of becoming part of that network, a very real possibility if he and his brothers failed in their mission. And the rest of the data that Arkin had given to them before they left wasn't any more reassuring. Even now, as they approached their landing zone near the city that had once been called Productive Unit Alpha 12- the place where the Code Demon had first manifested, according to the last, desperate transmissions from the planet, the Vox of the Space Marine's armor picked up transmissions from the ground. Astartes were no prone to sentimentalism, and those of the Fourth Legion even less so than the rest, but Carcios couldn't help but feel a tingle of apprehension at the sounds that his armor transmitted him sounds to clear to be broadcast by natural means and that made images of nightmare flash in his mind. Amidst screams of endless agony, mixed with praises to a dark god of bone cogs and oil blood, a hundred mutilated priests kneel before an effigy that he cannot see clearly. Great devices are being assembled with each other against their will, the machine spirits shrieking in pain as they are removed from existence by the code demon and replaced by unholy entities drawn from beyond the veil. Carcios shook his head to clear the visions. He didn't try to turn the Vox off, he needed it to communicate with his brothers, and, somehow, didn't believe that would solve the problem. Focusing on himself, he started reciting the unbreakable litany. From iron, cometh strength. From strength, cometh will. From will, cometh faith. The voices diminished, receding to a corner of his mind where he could easily ignore them. Looking around him, he saw that the rest of his brothers occupied their thoughts as they could, some of them were meditating, others checking their equipment one last time in preparation for the trial to come. All wore their helmets, but it did nothing to hide their nervosity from one who knew them as well as Karkios did. All six of them wore the colors of the Iron Warriors. Their armor had been repaired prior to their deployment, their guns reloaded and their blades sharpened. Karkios felt a surge of pride at the sight of his squad. They had once belonged to different squads, but the heavy casualty rate of their legion had brought them together in one of the last campaigns the Iron Warriors had fought in service of the False Emperor. United by necessity and bounds forged in the fire of battle, they had been together during all of the Civil War. They had burned their own homeworld together, fought side by side on Istvar and Vian besieged the walls of the Imperial Palace together. They had lost several of their brothers during all this time, but hadn't mourned them, they had died well fighting for the glory that had been too long denied to the Fourth Legion. Antipater, the heavy weapon specialist, was busying himself with double and triple checking his heavy bolter. The gun was covered in scriptures from Olympia's mythology, and would have been too heavy for a mortal man to carry at all. Even most legionaries were slowed down by it, but Antipater's muscles had been reinforced by important augmentic implants that allowed him to wield the heavy bolter as if it weighted no more than a more conventional fire weapon. He had used it for the first time on Istvan, firing the first shots when the order to fire on the loyalists had been given by Argil Tal of the Word Bearers. There were some who had whispered that such circumstances for the weapon's first blooding had caused it to be cursed by the treachery that had happened this day, and that one day, Antipater would die because of it. Perhaps they would be proved right one day, but Antipater had killed them for daring to phrase such things. To the Havoc's right. Praxiteles was stroking the edge of his power sword with one armored finger, humming to himself. The blade had once borne the sigil of the imperial fists, and he had claimed it during the Siege of Terror, prying it from the dead fingers of a champion of Dawn's legion whom he had killed himself, breaking his own weapon in the smug bastard's chest in the process. He had had the weapon's marking richly removed and replaced by the iron skull of his own during the weeks they had spent on their legion's ships, healing their wounds before returning to battle. It was a prize of great value that Praxiteles deserved, for few in the Fourth Legion could match his skill with a blade. Pelagios was sitting in front of the duelist, his hands clasped on his head, immobile in meditation. Before joining Karkios' squad, Pelagius had been a member of the War Masons, those of the Legion more gifted at building fortresses than at the art of war. He had been disgraced, however, when he had revealed a flaw in one of his superior's designs, and turned back into a battle brother. On the field, Carcios had discovered that Pelagius' gift for architecture actually made him a valuable asset, as he could visualize the best ways for the enemy to build its defenses, and the best ways to attack him. He was armed with a standard bolter and a gladius he had picked from an ultramarine's corpse during the 13's assault on the Hand of Ruin. 
Karkios didn't doubt that his brother was thinking about the plans of their destination arc and had provided them, as inaccurate as they may have become. He doubted that even a demon could think of better defenses than an iron warrior, especially one such as Pelagius. Karkios turned his gaze to the former war masons left. Nicanor and Xenon had been brothers before being inducted in the ranks of the Adeptus Astartes. They had been separated and sent to different training camps, each fighting on his own to earn his transformation into a genetic demigod. They had been reunited after years apart, already transformed into sons of Perturabo. They had originally belonged to different squads, but had come together under Karkio's leadership. They were both solid, reliable battle brother, fighting with the classical equipment of a legionary, bolter and chainsword. Despite their years of separation, they seemed to be able to divine the other's thoughts instantly, and fought as one on the battlefield, covering each other's back with preternatural efficiency. On both brothers' shoulders hung scrolls, with oaths of moments written on them in a fluid calligraphy that seemed out of place on a space marine's armor. The last member of the group, Zosimus, was the most important to their mission, and also the one who would be in the most danger once they reached the surface. He was a tech marine, a legionary trained in the ways of the Adeptus Maconicus on Mars herself. He wore a different model of power armor than the rest of them who were equipped with Mark IV armors. His was a customized one that he had crafted himself as part of his training. Runes had been added to its ornaments by the sorcerers of the coven, wards to keep aside the corruptive influence of the world's demonic overlord. The traditional third mechanical arm emerged from his backpack, and was currently helping his two other arms with checking the device he had to transport to the target point and activate, a sphere of metal the size of a legionary's head. Careful with that, Zosimus, said Karkios. The tech marine nodded without taking his eyes off whatever it was he was doing. Good. Brother or not, Karkios would have had to kill him if he had done so while in the middle of tinkering with something so crucial to their mission. Nearing destination, said the mechanical voice of the servitor that was piloting the Stormbird. The mortal pilot of the gunship had died during the exodus, and bringing a mortal to Mulet Ursus was too needlessly dangerous a risk of wasting valuable resources for the Iron Warriors to ask for another to replace him. Seconds later, they felt the drop in altitude. The landing site was a few kilometers away from one of the forged cities, in the middle of a desert created by the Maconicus' ruthless exploitation of the planet's natural resources and only made worse by the touch of the warp. They emerged from the Stormbird, weapons primed and ready, covering Zosimus and his precious cargo. There didn't seem to be any threat in sight, but that didn't mean anything on a world such as this one. Let's get started, ordered Karkios. And remember, don't listen to the voices. There was a succession of acknowledgments from his squadmates, and the seven forsaken sons began their walk amidst the dust of a world that had been violated twice, in the name of the Omnissiah first, and then according to the will of the Dark Gods. Clouds of ashes rose as they walked, surrounding them in a matter of minutes. The auspex of their armors were unable to pierce the obstacles, and they depended entirely on Zosimus' more advanced systems to keep going in the correct direction. Figures seemed to appear and disappear in the dust all around them, shadows of beings with claws and teeth hungering for the blood of the legionaries, yet unable to reach them, for now. After a period of time Karkios couldn't be sure of, the chronometers of his armor had started to derail almost as soon as the Stormbird had entered this planet's upper atmosphere, Antipater spoke. His voice was rich with Vox corruption. I think I see something. Some kind of structure. We are not supposed to reach the outer walls of the Forge City before another three kilometers, answered Zosimus in his synthetic voice. The tech marine had lost his vocal cords during his sojourn on Mars, in which circumstances no one but himself knew. Who knows if the Forge City is still at the same size, or even at the same bloody position? Intervened Praxiteles. The duelist had his sword drawn, his bolt pistol in the other hand, aiming at the silhouettes he thought he could see in the cloud. The awakened one was right, this world is completely under the Empyrean's control now. Do you think that the Warpborn know it is thanks to us? Probably, said Karkios. And they surely don't care. Be vigilant. Antipater had been right. Only seconds later, a gust of wind momentarily broke the clouds, and revealed to the squad what had once been productive Unit Alpha 12. By Perturabo's blood. The walls of the city now reached several kilometers beyond its initial borders. From where the Space Marines stood, several hundred of meters away, it was also clear that they were also a lot higher than they should have been. 
They had easily the size of an Imperator-class Titan, and were not made of just steel or concrete. Flesh and bones were merged with more classical building materials, pulsing with unnatural life as they kept the structure together. Karkios thought that he could see blood flow across the walls, up and down, in currents that were contradictory, as if under the pulse of several titanic hearts. There were also shapes that seemed to be giant unblinking eyes, staring at the desolate landscape around them, as if searching for intruders. It was ugly, it was an abomination, and yet, part of the Iron Warrior's soul was in awe at the sight. Such mighty fortifications, all under the control of one intelligence. Once more, they were reminded of the level of power they were dealing with here. It was more necessary than ever that they succeed in their mission. Hostiles incoming, said Pelagius, cutting short his brother's thoughts. They snapped back to attention, their weapons aiming at the direction the fallen war mason was pointing. Dozens of grotesquely shaped silhouettes were drawing near at high speed. As they get closer, the Astartes was able to discern them more clearly. Skatari, at least, he thought, that was what they had been when the warp storm had hit Muletertius. Now, the wretched creatures were something else entirely. Karkios had seen some of the last model of biomechanic soldiers used by the War Master's allies in the Mechanicum during the Siege of Terror, and had thought them disgusting if efficient. In retrospect, now that he saw what true warp craft could do, these had been but children's attempts at emulating something far beyond their darkest nightmares. The creature's weapons were alive, there was no other word for the way the things moved, seemingly of their own will, as if their bearer was their servant instead of the other way around. The chain weapons were not equipped with teeth of adamantium, but with real teeth, blood dripping from their mechanisms even as they weren't in use. Cannons were depicting the mouth of demons at their extremity, with eyes that moved and targeted the forsaken sons. The weapons were mounted directly into the Skitari's bodies, replacing the limbs they had once possessed. What little flesh remained at the center of the machinery was sickly pale, with black veins that pulsed under the influence of the demonic engines the pathetic beings supported. Screams of binary were coming out of the speakers that had replaced their mouths, horrible sounds that Karkios couldn't understand but knew were either threats of pleas for death. Fire. The seven Astartes shot at the incoming Skatari. The bolts shredded dying flesh and corrupted metal alike, taking down more than a third of the assailants in the seconds it took the Skatari to reach their enemies. Despite their own ranged weapons, the constructs didn't stop to aim, instead charging while firing wildly, missing the space marines by wide margins. Then the two groups made contact, and the melee began. Karkios raised his chainsword, and bellowed. For the awakened one. Kill them all, brothers. Let's show the master of this world how the Forsaken Sons fight. The Skatari were bred and built for battle, used to fight even beyond their enhanced limits thanks to the extensive use of stimulants, and trained by the implantation of battle knowledge directly into their processor brains. The demonic transformation they had undertaken may have been horrendous, but it had also made them even quicker and stronger, their weapons moving of their own to seek a killing blow. Despite their losses, they also outnumbered the Astartes more than six to one. The last of them died 247 seconds after the engagement's beginning. Antipater stood at the back of the group, opening fire in short and precise volleys to avoid friendly fire. Nicanor and Zenon stood by his side, protecting the havoc and the tech marine that was behind them from the few enemies that reached them with their own bolters and chain swords. Carcios, Praxiteles and Pelagius were at the front, fighting with their melee weapons. It was a formation they had used during all of the Civil War, and it had always served them well. They covered each other back instinctly, dispatching their foes with an ease born of decades of practice. They were Ostartes, they were death incarnate. Their blades found the vulnerabilities in the Skatari's armored forms and guards, cutting at what little flesh remained. Landing a killing blow was almost impossible as the creatures had no more vital organs to target. But even the demons within their weapons couldn't keep them alive when their head was removed, or when too much of the unholy mix of blood, oil and black demonic ichor that flowed through them was spilled by a dozen different wounds. That was a bit disappointing, said Praxiteles as he removed his blade from his last foe's cybernetic skull. I was hoping for more of a challenge. Praxiteles, shut up. The Octid may be listening to you. A few chuckles echoed on the Vox channel at Karkio's rebuttal. Squad, advance. These things must have got out of the city somehow, and we need a way in. Karkio's was right. 
There was an opening at the basis of the walls, looking more like a fresh wound torn in the material than anything built by mortal hands. They advanced through it, feeling as if they were microbes using a wound to infiltrate some colossal organism. The tunnel looked much like the interior of a living thing, similar to the way the walls had looked at the outside. This is most fascinating, muttered Zosimus. The war born at the root of this transformation appears to have resolved the problem of reject that most grafts between metal and flesh encounter. Zosimus, cut Carchios, stop admiring the work of the one who is trying to kill us. With due respect, Carchios, I don't think that was the Code Demon's goal. There must be tens of thousands of these transformed soldiers in this forged city alone, yet we haven't met anyone since we entered this tunnel. Logic dictates that our previous encounter must have been a test of sort rather than a real attempt to stop us. Demons aren't logical, Tech Marine. Stay focused on your part of the mission, and we will take care of the rest. They kept on walking. The tunnel was several hundred meters long, did the actual wall had the same width, which seemed unlikely, or were they being misled by some trick of the warp? Karkios didn't know, and as they neared the exit, they heard a tremor. The tunnel was starting to close. Under the command of whatever fell intelligence commanded this place, the opening in the defenses was vanishing. The sides of the tunnel were drawing closer and closer, ready to crush the space marines like worms. Run! shouted Karkios, following his own advice. The sound of hundreds of tons of material moving was deafening, even with the filtering of his helmet, but he could see that his brothers had heard him. That, or they had just made the same decision for themselves. They ran with all their might, their speed seeming to defy gravity. If a mortal had watched them, he would have been in awe at the speed that the heavily armored warriors were reaching. But the power armor they wore didn't slow them down, in fact, it only enhanced their muscles. They crossed the remaining distance in a handful of seconds, but by that time the walls were already less than two meters apart. Karkios was first to get through the exit, immediately followed by his brothers. There was a screeching sound the sound of stone and flesh meeting ceramite. Karkios turned back, and he saw something that would haunt him until the day of his death. Antipater, slowed down by the weight of his heavy bolter, had been too late to escape the collapsing tunnel. He had been caught by the walls just as he reached the exit, and was being crushed by the walls of the fortress. Karkios could hear him swear on the vox, cursing the fates and the gods for such a death. With trembling arms, the havoc managed to toss his weapon outside. He looked up at his sergeant, and, just before the walls closed on him, said. I suppose that damn curse was a real thing, eh? Then, there was a final crushing sound, and he was gone. In seconds, nothing could distinguish that portion of the wall that had just killed a legionary from the rest of it. That isn't a death for an iron warrior, whispered Praxiteles, his squad mates silently agreeing. An Astartes should meet his final end on a battlefield, surrounded by the corpses of his foes not full victim of some twist of fate like this. There was little camaraderie amongst the sons of Perturabo, but even the cold-hearted legionaries felt a tingle of sorrow at such a destiny. What do we do about his bolter? asked Zenon. None of them seemed disposed to pick up the weapon. Finally, shaking off such superstitions, Karkios took the bolter and Mag locked it to his backpack. Someone on the Hand of Ruin may be willing to take it. It's not as if any of us is stranger to using weapons whose previous owner died. Now, let's go. The objective must not be far. The six surviving marines looked around, and found themselves surrounded by towering buildings of the same unholy material that the walls, the purpose of which none of them, save perhaps Zosimus, thought Karkios, could understand. They couldn't, however, see any of the dark place's inhabitants. This reeks of a trap, grunted Phalagius. We were lured here, Karkios. Probably, admitted the sergeant. Zosimus, do you detect anything? There wasn't an answer. A terrible suspicion began to dawn in Karkios' mind. Had his brother been compromised by the Code Demon? He turned toward the Tech Marine, slowly, ready to aim his bolter if his doubt was to be revealed true. There didn't seem to be anything wrong with his brother, he was simply standing, immobile, looking at the buildings. Zosimus? What is wrong? The tech marine finally looked back at his brother. When he spoke, his artificial voice managed to carry an hint of fear despite being, as always, utterly toneless. We are not alone, brothers. What do you mean? I think he means me, Karkios of the Forsaken Sons. 
The voice was booming, and seemed to come from every direction at once. Kakio's human hearing was troubled by the sound, as if picking something abnormal with it but not being able to determine it what. It took the Astartes a few seconds to understand, and he felt blood drain from his face. The voice was coming from openings in the wall behind him and the buildings in front of him, all at once, as if it was being spoken by a thousand mouths. And yet, the sound waves have reached his ears at the exact same time. There was nothing especially dangerous about it, but it was, unsettling, to say the least. What in the War Master's name are you? I am many things, little Kakios. I am the gift of chaos to this world. I am the taint that twists the machine, freeing it from the constraints of the materium. I am the ruin of logic and reason, the triumph of will over matter. I am all of this, and I am your former legion's future. What do you mean by that, demon? Your master didn't tell you? He saw it, though, in the dreams he can now only have with his oracle's help. Your father, the great Perturabo, has already ascended. He is one of us now, and his legion must either follow, die, or embrace me and my ilk. It is fated, written in the stars themselves. We do not believe in fate any more that I will believe in your words, Warborn. What do you want? I have tasted the blood and flesh of one of your own already, little Kakios. It has been enough to sate my hunger for a moment. Now, I am curious. What do you want, forsaken son? Why are you here? What is the mission your master gave you before sending you here to my domain? Kakios thought furiously for a moment before coming to a conclusion. Their objective was now clearly beyond their reach. But there was still a way the mission could be accomplished. He cleared his throat, and spoke trying to stop the doubt he felt from showing in his voice. We are here to make a bargain with you, demon. Our master wishes for your alliance in his war against the false emperor. The anathema is the enemy of all who walk the warp, but I would not make such compromises with mortals unless they have something to offer to me. What has your master to give that would make me even consider such a thing? The sergeant gestured towards Osimus, who was still holding the device given by the awakened one. We were given this artifact by our master. He didn't tell us what it was, lied Karkios, only that you would know its nature if we could bring it to one of your avatars on this world, and that it would be his offering to you, to prove his good faith. Really? I sense treachery on your tongue, little Karkios, but there is power in that item, bring it to me, steel merged. Dark tentacles emerged from one of the buildings, each the diameter of a space marine's torso, and creeped towards Osimus. The tech marine walked to meet them, nothing betraying the unease he had to be feeling at this moment, so close to the touch of a warp. He stopped two meters away from the appendices, and held the sphere up at arm's length. The tentacles closed on the device, now, shouted Karkios over the vox, but Zosimus had already begun to act. With his mechanical limb, he pressed one single button on the sphere, then jumped back, away from the device and the code demon's presence. What pathetic trick is! The thousand voices of the Walk Born were drowned by a tremendous impact of psychic energy, and a flash of light that blinded all the space marines. The last sound the former Iron Warriors heard before falling unconscious was the scream of rage and unbelief of the Code Demon. We have it, said Arsim, his hands tightened around his staff. Go ahead, Arkan, the connection is open. I doubt we will be able to keep it that way for long, too. The master of the Forsaken Sons advanced at the center of the room. Around him, all the members of the coven were focusing their psychic might to keep the device Merchurian and the psychers had designed. The techno-adept himself was regulating a myriad of screens and other data, the nature of which Arkan couldn't even begin to guess. It had taken the entire journey from Ilias to the Mueller system for the sorcerers and the adept to work out how to build what Arkan had demanded from them and a lot of the spoils from Mueller Primus had been used to make it reality. But they had succeeded in the end. They had constructed a way to open a conduct between this chamber aboard the Hand of Ruin and the device that Arkan had entrusted to Karkios and his warriors. When the catalyst had been activated, the signal had been received on the ship, and the coven had opened contact with the Code Demon's very essence, summoning it to the ship, where it could be, bargained with. In front of Arkan was a spectral, half-formed image of a horn skull, floating in the air. It bellowed in impotent rage, trapped aboard the ship by the coven sorcery and Merchurian's forbidden arcanes. What is the meaning of this? Treachery. Deception. Mortal sneakiness. I will have your souls for that. All of you. 
You will die and be reborn and die again, for all eternity. Your blood will oil the gears of my world. Your bones will. Be silent, demon. The burning sockets of the skull turned toward Arkan, and the awakened one continued, unfazed by the demon's malevolent gaze. One of my warriors died to bring you here with me, demon, so you better listen or, by the octid, I will destroy you and all you have built upon this world you claim as yours. What have you done, mortal? We have brought you here. Don't you understand? Right now, your very essence is here, on this ship, in this room. But your power, that is a different matter. I admit that some of these matters are beyond my grasp, but I know this, at this point of time and space, you are powerless. Your power is on the world below us, keeping your kingdom of corrupted flesh and dark metal working in defiance of all the laws of reality. You are C2746 DSS 885, Demon. And now, you are at my mercy. There isn't a drop of mercy in your black, dead heart, son of Horus. Arkan shook his head, as if saddened by the demon's words. I am no longer a son of Horus, Warborn. I am a forsaken son now. You would do well to remember that. So, what is this? For what purpose did you send your warriors to my domain? The code demon's voice was dripping with smoldering rage, but it was contained for now. I want to make a bargain with you, demon. One that could even benefit you. Your power on your world is great, of that there is no question, but I know there are things even a being of the warp requires to indulge whatever whims it has at the moment. Fresh souls, artifacts of war, metal, you cannot just summon all you need out of thin air. You aren't powerful enough to do that. The skull tilted in the air. Arkan had its interest now. Why all of this, then? You could have come in person. Make a deal with me on the ground of my world. Arkan actually smiled at that, with that dead smile of his that his brethren had come to know indicated that he found something funny on some intellectual level, but was unable to properly convey into an emotion. The first rule of negotiations, of course, always be in a position of strength. On your world, I would have been at your mercy. Here, as I said earlier, you are at mine. My sorcerers can channel the very power of the storm into this room if they need to, enough psychic energy to destroy your essence, to undo your immortality and send you into oblivion. You have no choice but to accept my offer now. The code demon stayed silent for a moment, then spoke again, in a tone filled with hatred and the barest hints of a grudging respect. Then what do you want, forsaken son? Karkios had woken up in the hand of Ruin's apothecary and after a few scans from the flesh masters, as the apothecaries aboard the ship had come to call themselves, he had been given back his power armor and sent to the awakened one. Ah, Karkios, said Arkan as the former iron warrior entered the stratagem where the forsaken son's leader now spent most of his time. It is good to see you have woken up. For a moment, I feared the communion device's psychic blast would have killed you. I am not that easy to kill, my lord, said Karkios while bowing. The mission? It is a success, brother. Your brothers live too, although you are only the second one to have awakened for now. I have established a compact with the Code Demon, just as planned. Walk with me, if you please. There is something I want to show you. The two marines crossed several sections of the ship before arriving at their destination. Karkios recognized the place, this was a hangar dedicated to the maintenance of heavy support. When they had fled terror, the place had been filled with the wreckage of the tanks they had managed to bring aboard with them, but, so far as Karkios knew, they had been mostly left alone as the teams of servitors and tech priests focused on repairing the Astartes' armor. And yet, as they entered the vast room, Karkios saw a land raider that didn't appear to have ever suffered any damage. In fact, it didn't even seem to have ever been in battle. Could it be? Yes, confirmed Arkin. This is the first of the deliveries from our new ally according to the terms of the contract. I must say, I didn't think the Code Demon would be able to create one so perfectly on the first try, even with the data we gave it. I am looking forward to the other, commands I have made. Of course, we will need to gather resources to trade before we can obtain them. How long was I asleep? These things are supposed to take months to be made. And perhaps that's just how much time it took. Who knows? Mule Tertius is so deep in the warp that it may have been months down there since we picked you up. Anyway, how would you like to name it? Karkios looked at his lord with surprise in his eyes. Name it? Yes. It was your pack that paid the price for it, wasn't it? 
It is only fitting that I entrust it to you and your men then. Besides, the Fourth Legion is famous for its mastery of heavy machinery like this. Your tech marine is already inside, checking that everything is all right. So far, he has only reported the most minor modifications to the initial design. Karkios looked at the colossal war machine. To think that this was his to command, he had piloted a land raider once, during the Great Crusade. He remembered well the feeling of absolute power, the invulnerability one felt when leading such a tank into battle. Then I accept your gift with gratitude, my lord. Me and my men shall lead the Antipater's wrath into battle in your name, for the glory of the Forsaken Sons.